gentlemen of the radio audience, this is Graham McNamee speaking. We bring you a period of delightful entertainment sponsored by Coca-Cola, that pure drink of natural flavors served nine million times a day. A half hour devoted to popular music and unusual news of sports by Grant and Rice. We dedicate this program to the pause that refreshes. The pause that refreshes, as everybody knows, means to drop your cares for a minute, relax, and enjoy the life and sparkle you find in an ice-cold Coca-Cola. First, a famous song from the famous talkie... Sunny side up. I'm a dreamer. Aren't we all? that you're listening to an orchestra different from any that's ever been on the air. The Coca-Cola Orchestra is an all-string orchestra. It doesn't even have a saxophone. And it's different, too, because it's conducted by Leonard Joy, famous recording artist. Every piece we'll hear this evening is especially arranged just for us. For instance, here is My Gal Sal in a brand new dress.
here's one that bubbles to the brim. Sweeter than sweet. It'll make you want to dance. by the Coca-Cola Orchestra is a tango. Rosita, refreshing music that comes to us from the other America. Like Coca-Cola, it had to be good to get where it is.
Now we'll let the members of the orchestra pause and refresh themselves while we sit back, relax, and enjoy a special treat. Just the time for a nice cold bottle of delicious and refreshing Coca-Cola. Standing beside me is a man who is perhaps the world's most famous writer of sports, Grantland Rice. With him is a man whose name is a household word, the idol of baseball fans everywhere. In his day, the keenest batting eye in baseball, star of place hitters, and the fastest base runner, none other than Ty Cobb, the man who has broken practically every record in baseball. Grant Rice will interview Ty Cobb on baseball and the coming season. Grant? Thanks, Graham. Well, Ty, you faced Walter Johnson's fast one when he had more smoke than a burning oil well. Now you're facing the mic. Which seems the easier? Well, I think I'll take a chance on Walter. This mic kind of gives me stage fright. Well, Ty, you've asked me not to make this too personal, but you have played in more ball games, you have made more hits, you have stolen more bases, and you have scored more runs than any player that ever lived. A record like this is a personal matter with a good many million people. First of all, I would like to ask you the biggest thrill you ever got in any one game. Well, Grantland, I've played in over 4,000 ball games in the last 25 years, and the biggest thrill I ever got came in a game against the Athletics in 1907. I was only 20 years old then, not quite 21. And it looked as if this game meant to pennant. The Athletics had us beaten with Rube Waddell pitching. They were two runs ahead in the ninth inning when I happened to hit a home run that tied the score. This game went 17 innings to a tie. And a few days later, we clinched our first pennant. You can understand what it meant for a 20-year-old country boy to hit a home run off the great Rube in a pennant-winning game with two out in the ninth. Boy. I suppose you've missed the old game a lot, Ty. All the thrills and crowds and the headlines and all. I thought I would miss it a lot, Graham, but I haven't. It's a great old game. But I've almost felt like a prisoner who was set free. Just how do you mean, Ty? Baseball, to me, was more work than play. In fact, it was all work. You see, I was lucky enough to lead the league when I was 20 years old. After that, I wanted to lead it every year. I never thought I was a, any genius, so I gave up my life to the game for 25 years. I suppose I was in nearly 30,000 plays, and I at least tried to think about every play and uh, how it should be made. Here is one example. I figured out one play to use against Hal Chase. He used to snap the ball over to third to catch me rounding the bag. I'd always slide back. I had to wait two years for the right time to work it. But one day, I just kept on going and managed to score the winning run. Did you have any set system to work on, Ty? Yes. My system was all offense. I believed in putting up a mental hazard for the other fellow. If we were five or six runs ahead, I'd try some wild play, such as going from first, first to home on a single. This helped to make the other side hurry the play in a close game later on. I worked out all the angles I could think of to keep them guessing and hurrying. Every play was a problem of some sort. That's what I meant by the strain and grind of 25 years. Who was the best pitcher you ever faced, Ty? Walter Johnson had more stuff, although Ed Walsh in his prime was a wonder. But the ones who gave me the most trouble were pitchers like uh, Mogridge, Carl Wildman, and Carter, all left-handers who depended more on slow curves and dinky dinks. They bothered me more than speed or fast curves. Well, who is the hardest hitter you ever saw? Well, you, you can't beat the babe. Ruth is one of the few who can take a terrific swing and still meet the ball solidly. 
His timing is perfect. Lajewey was the hardest line hitter I ever saw, and I'd like to see Sam Crawford, Joe Jackson, and Frank Schutte lay against this modern ball. But none of them had the combined eye and power of Ruth. There's one thing, Ty, I've always wondered about, and so have many others. How did your legs ever stand the strain of more than 4,000 ball games and more than 4,000 hits when you were always at top speed? Well, in, in the first place, I always tried to keep in condition. And I can tell all the boys that means everything. For instance, I only ate two meals a day. I built up my legs in two ways. I hunted all through the winter, frequently walking all day long. I almost lived on my legs. In addition, I always hunted in heavy boots. When the training season opened, I fixed a piece of lead to my shoes. I took the lead off when the pennant race opened, and I felt as if I could run faster. I lost some of the old spring in the last year or two, but my legs today are as strong as they were. If you want good legs, you have to put them to work. I never gave mine any holidays. How did you steal so many bases, Ty? There were others just about as fast. As I said before, you had to do more thinking in the old days when home runs were fewer. Games were close, and every play counted. The two most important things in base stealing are getting the jump on the pitcher and making your slide away from the baseman. In stealing bases, I always watched the baseman's eyes to know where the ball was coming. His eyes had to watch the ball. I didn't have the time for this, but his eyes told me. And then I knew where to throw my body away from the basement. I am pretty sure, Ty, everybody would like to have you pick the next two pennant winners. For any good pennant-winning ball club, the second year is the easiest to repeat. The Athletics and the Cubs were both good teams. And I think they will be fighting it out again in the next World Series. That's my pick, anyway. Thanks a lot, Grant, and you, Ty. I believe I can speak for just about everybody when I say I'm looking forward right now to the interview Grant Rice is preparing for next week with another famous figure in the world of sport. And now, off to a fresh start with the Coca-Cola Orchestra playing its own version of Wild Rose.
Most of us have forgotten how to waltz. Yet we want the Coca-Cola Orchestra to play for you Sweet Mystery of Life, set to waltz time. We'll just relax again in our easy chairs and enjoy another pause that refreshes. Ready for another dance? Here's one everybody is thirsty for. I am following you. A special interpretation by Leonard Joy and the Coca Cola Orchestra.
just heard the first of the Coca-Cola Top Notchers, featuring Grantland Rice and Ty Cobb with Leonard Joy and the Coca-Cola Orchestra. A program of tingling music and sparkling news of sports as refreshing as ice-cold Coca-Cola itself. week, at this same time, you'll again hear the Coca-Cola Orchestra and Grantland Rice interviewing another top-notcher, Stuart Maiden, the man who taught Bobby Jones to play golf from the world of sports. Listen in. Everybody's invited. This is Graham McNamee bidding you good night all and refreshing rest. Coca-Cola Top Notchers have come to you from the New York studios of the National Broadcasting Company. Tonight we inaugurate a series of broadcast episodes over this station entitled Abroad with the Lockhart. Mr. and Mrs. Lockhart are the typical American Mr. and Mrs. who go abroad. Mr. Lockhart is a businessman, comfortable, blunt, knows his own mind, enjoys his business and his community. A plain American businessman. Mrs. Lockhart is the pleasant type of American wife. A thorough housekeeper, belongs to the woman's club and the literary club of her town, and still retains the spirit of romance. Their complex situations, we are certain, will delight the friends of this station each week. The scene tonight is the living room of the Lockharts. where uh, Hoover was fishing again last weekend. Was he? Yeah, but uh, he didn't catch any. I'll bet he thinks that fish are almost as stubborn as senators. He can't be using the right bait. Now, when I go fishing this summer... That's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, fishing? Why, certainly, uh, my dear. Why didn't you say so? Uh, turn off the radio. No, dear, not fishing. Uh, what then? I want to talk to you about this summer. Well, this summer means fishing to me. Dear, I want to show you something. Here it is. What's this? It's a circular. Circular? About what? A circular about Europe. Oh, so that's it. 
I, I threw out about 50 of those things last week. They, they were all over the house. I just want you to look at it. Well, leave it here. I'll, I'll look at it later on. I want you to look at it now, dear. Oh, well, uh, where are my glasses? On your forehead. Yeah, you know, these circulars are a delusion. They only tell you what they want you to know, not what you ought to know. Now, let's see. Uh, tour Europe with us. Seven glorious countries. Fifty wonderful days. Oh, isn't it huh. thrilling, dear? Maybe, but I don't want to go to Europe. I want to go fishing. Do you know what year this is? I do. Well, I don't think you do. This is our tenth anniversary year, and you promised me that you'd give me just what I wanted. Did I? And I want a trip to Europe. Nearly every other woman at our club has been to Europe, and I'm beginning to feel such a frump. And it isn't as if we couldn't afford it. And I want you to take me. Well, isn't this kind of sudden? Now, I've only mentioned it once a day for the last six months. Oh, but shucks, I I just thought you were only talking. Read the circular, dear. See? Six days of calm seas and sunny skies and then... A storm. No. Paris. Paris? Paris. The French people call it Paris. Oh, so that's why you've been having this French teacher here every week. Yes, dear. I want to be able to take you around Paris myself. We'll visit the Tuileries. Who are they? Oh, they're not people, dear. It's a sort of a place with a garden. And uh, and then we'll see the invalids. My dear, I don't want to go to Europe to visit invalids. Oh, they're not invalids. That's just their name. What are they, then? Now, that's just why I want you to go. I hear the other women talking about invalids and the goblins. The goblins? Oh, they must be those things on the top of the Notre Dame Cathedral. And then there's the Malmo Maison. What's that? Well, in English that means bad house, but it isn't. Then there's the Versailles Palace with 400 rooms. Stop right there. If you expect me to walk through 400 rooms, the trip's off. No, dear, we don't have to... We don't have to walk through any of them. And then, then there, then there's uh, the uh, museum. There's 24 museums in Paris. Now listen, my dear. I was in one museum in my life, the Eden Museum in New York, and that was enough for me. Well, dear, we don't have to go into them. Oh, I'd rather go fishing. You can fish in the sea. Yes, and catch frogs. Then we can walk through the Latin Quarter. More walking. And see all those funny artists. And we don't have to go to Europe to see funny artists, my dear. That fellow you had at your club last week, he was... Oh, then we can go to Switzerland and see the Alps and hear the yodlers. But, dear, we've heard yodlers. And then, and then to Italy and go through all those marvelous cathedrals. No cathedrals for me. And in Rome, we'll visit the catacombs. Are they damp? Well, I don't know. Well, no catacombs anyway. All right, dear. But in Florence... We can see all the wonderful tombs of the famous dead people. I'd much rather go fishing. And then we'll visit Venice and ride in gondolas. What do you call them? Gondolas. I thought it was gondolas. Now, that's just why a trip would be good for you, dear. You'll know how to pronounce all those names. It's much easier to buy a dictionary. Oh, why will you be so obstinate? Can't you see I've set my heart on going? I'm tired of hearing other women say, when I was in Paris and when I was in Rome, I tell you, I've made up my mind and I'm going to Europe this summer, even if I have to go alone. Alone? Yes, if I have to. But uh, what would I do? Who'd look after me? That's your affair. I think after ten years I deserve the sort of holiday I want and not the sort of holiday you want. Are you in earnest? I was never more in earnest in my life. Well, dear, of course, you know, I always want you to have what you want. So I noticed. And if your mind is really made up... It is? Well, I... it's, uh, well, all right. Of course, I'll have to cancel my fishing trip and see about our reservations on the steamer. Uh, maybe, maybe we can't get any. I've already made them. What? I've made reservations for sailing on the same day you were to start your fishing trip. Well, I'll be... And, dear, we're going to be in Venice on the night of our 10th anniversary. Are we now? That, that's sort of nice and poetic-like. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Well, now, <clears throat> just a minute. We've got to have an agreement. 
If I go to Europe with you, I don't want to walk eight miles a day getting educated. No, dear. And I don't want to see any museums. No, dear. Or cathedrals. No, dear. Or catacombs. No, dear. Or tombs of famous dead ones. No, dear. No, you can do just as you like. You can sit in the car while I see them. Well, that's all right. Of course, there may be one or two of the important places I might like to see. Certainly, dear, just as you like. Well, all right, that's settled. Oh, you're a darling. Here's a kiss for you. Now I'll have to call up Charlie Morris and tell him our fishing trip is off. Lord, he'll be sore. Hello, operator. Uh, main uh, four, three, two, one. Uh, what sort of clothes do we wear? Oh, I have it all planned. You will take your plus fours, your gray suit, and your dinner jacket, and your dark suit. And I've ordered a tweed traveling suit and a summer dress. Oh, you have? Yes, dear. And the rest? Well, the rest I'll get in Paris. Uh-huh. I begin to see. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Is that you, Charlie? Uh, this is Will speaking. Yes. Uh, say, Charlie, about that uh, fishing trip. I'm afraid you'll have to count me out. Count me out. No, I can't go. That's what I said. Well, Charlie, the wife and I are going to Europe. That's right, Europe. Crazy. <laughs> not, not that I know of. Now, now, wait, wait a minute, Charlie. You see, uh, I've been thinking about it for some time. Oh, yes, I have. And I've decided that the wife needs the trip. So I've made up my mind, and I have a wonderful little tour planned and everything. Yeah. All right. Uh, Charlie, uh, drop me a card if you catch any big ones. All right. Goodbye. There we are, dear. You're the nicest husband a woman ever managed. Well, I, I guess every husband would be nice if he had a wife like you. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me uh, study that circular a bit and see what we're going to get. And uh, turn on the radio, dear. Tour Europe with us. Seven glorious countries. Fifty wonderful days. Ah, well, we'll see. <laughs> Tour Europe with us. Seven glorious countries. Well, you have just started to go abroad with the Lockhart. <laughs> Next week is sailing day. And this typical American Mr. and Mrs. again will delight us from on shipboard. Be sure to tune in next week at the same hour and enjoy a trip abroad with the Lockhart. campaign of ginger ale presents a series of programs to advertise the new made-to-order Canada Dry, which you can now buy by the glass at drug stores and soda fountains. This series will feature George Olson and his music, Miss Ethel Chute, the star of many Broadway successes, 
and that suave comedian, dry humorous, and famous master of ceremonies, Jack Benny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thorgerson. That's pretty good from a man who doesn't even know me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Benny talking and making my first appearance on the air professionally. By that I mean I'm finally getting paid, which of course will be a great relief to my creditors. I, uh, I really don't know why I'm here. I'm supposed to be a sort of a master of ceremonies and tell you all the things that will happen, which would happen anyway. I must introduce the different artists who could easily introduce themselves and also talk about the Canada Dry made to order by the glass, which is a waste of time, as you know all about it. You drink it like it and don't want to hear about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, a master of ceremonies is really a fellow who is unemployed and gets paid for it. I think you will like the entertainment arranged for tonight, I hope. Of course, I haven't seen any of the program myself, but I've spoken to the artists individually. They seem to think it's awfully good. The uh, first number will be a selection by George Olson and his orchestra. I think this uh, being our first program together, it is no more than fair that I have you meet Mr. Olson personally. He's really a very charming fellow and one of the few directors who comes to and from his work on roller skates. That's perhaps the silliest thing that I'll say all night, I think. I, um, I might add that Mr. Olson is very, very handsome. I told you, George, I'd get that in. Uh, but as long as we are both on the air, of course, I won't have to worry about that. Oh, George, uh, come here. I want you to say hello to the folks. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, that was George Olson, ladies and gentlemen. He uh, rehearsed that speech all week. You know, uh, this is really all play with George. He doesn't have to work at all. I might say that uh, Mr. Olson is one of the wealthiest conductors in America. You know what I mean. He owns his own car. Of course, the other boys are in debt, too. Uh, George, uh, what kind of a car have you? A Saxon. A what? A Saxon. A Saxon, huh? Well, that was my fault for bringing it up at all. I... Uh, is it a new one, is it? Oh, yes. Yeah, a very late model. I see. Well, you must have been in this country a long time now, haven't you, Georgia? <laughs> yeah, say, by the way, Jack, what kind of a car have you? Me? I have a bicycle built for two. I mean, now, you can't go back any further than that, I think. Well, George, I think we ought to get started. What's the first number? I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. It's a French number, Jack. Do you like French numbers? Do I? Mon duck, mon duck. <laughs> important directing that orchestra, you know, with the baton in your hand. I don't know, there's something about all you fellas when you stand there waving that stick in the air. It's thrilling, you know. One thing I'd like to know, George, if the band didn't show up, what would you do with that stick? Why, I'd throw it away and do what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Always kidding. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I present a young lady who is a star of many New York productions, Miss Ethel Chute. 
Uh, you will remember Mr. Tay Best and Whoopi playing opposite Eddie Cantor. Is it all right for me to mention Cantor's name here? Everybody else does. Uh, Ethel, come over and say hello. Oh, hello. Wasn't that clever? <laughs> oh, she does a lot of things like that. You'd be surprised. And Miss Chute is going to sing for us. She has a beautiful voice, too. She has a sort of a nervous soprano. You know what I mean? She, in fact, last week she had her nose lifted so she could be heard in Philadelphia. <laughs> And, uh, oh, by the way, here's a little news for you might interest you. Miss Chute is really Mrs. George Olson. Although I wouldn't go as far as to say that that's the reason she happens to be on this program. Nevertheless, she's Mrs. George Olson. Such a nice girl, too. I'm surprised that she's married to Olson. And now uh, Miss Chute will sing, uh, I Found a Million Dollar Baby. I still feel a little Frenchy tonight, Ethel, so it's Mon Duck to you, too. <laughs> I forgot to mention that Miss Chute was assisted by Fran Fry. Of course, I'm lucky that I remember anything tonight. Uh, but you know, folks, all the time Miss Chute was singing, I kept thinking of my girl. You know, I get so sentimental. I really have a girl. She lives in Newark, New Jersey. You know, the girl I go with when I'm in Newark? She's not what you'd call good-looking exactly. In fact, she's quite homely, but then she can't stay in the house all the time. I... I, I imagine you folks have seen her pictures in different magazines. You know, she poses for the beauty ads entitled Before Taking. And she um, 
comes from a very fine family, although her father very often partakes of the forbidden beverage. It's all right for me to mention that, as they have no radio. In fact, her father drank everything in the United States and then went up north to drink Canada Dry. <whistles> Boy, I'm glad I thought of that, Joe. You know, the one about Canada Dry? I'm really supposed to mention it occasionally. After all, I, I owe it to my sponsors, and they might be listening in. Uh, seriously, though, do you realize, folks, that if you want a drink of Canada Dry, we'll say just a glass. You don't have to buy it in the bottle. You can walk into any drugstore or soda fountain that has that big sign, Canada Dry, made to order, ask for a glass and get it. I know you always have it in your home in bottles, but isn't it nice to know that you don't have to wait until you get home to drink it? Gee, I thought I did that pretty well for a new salesman, eh? I suppose nobody will drink it now. And now, folks, a very stirring number called I Love a Parade with a vocal refrain by the Messrs. Fran Fry, Bobby Borger, and Bob Wright. Because I love a parade, ladies and gentlemen. The kind of a number that grips and thrills you, gives you that great feeling of patriotism, and makes you glad that you're an American. Personally, it didn't bother me very much because I took a nap while the boys were playing it. And uh, uh, now, folks, in case you've forgotten, this is Jack Benny again. You know, the Canada Dry Humorist. Say, I thought that was good. The Canada Dry Humorist. I made that up myself, huh? It sounds like it. Uh, that witty retort was by George Olson, ladies and gentlemen, proving again that he is still an orchestra leader. At that, uh, George has a great sense of humor. Say, he told me a, st a story the other day. Do you mind if I tell it, George? I'll give you credit for it, you know. It's really supposed to be true, too. It's about George's uncle, who had been ill for a long time. He had what you call labor poisoning. You know what I mean? He just would, couldn't stand working. So his doctor finally told him that he would have to get a lot of fresh air, do outside work, but not lift anything heavy. He told him that at no time was he to lift anything heavy. So his uncle got a job as a garbage man in Scotland. Funny, I... Funny, you know, I never heard that one before, but the thing that kills me is Olsen telling a Scotch story. I mean, because George, you know, is no senseless himself. He, in fact, he invited me to dinner the other night, much to his own surprise. 
and he paid the check with a $5 bill that was in his pocket so long that Lincoln's eyes were bloodshot. <laughs> That's a fact. Uh, however, he will now favor us with that very popular song hit called Paradise. After all, why should his orchestra be an, an exception? <laughs> George Olson speaking. Uh, by this time, I know you're thoroughly bored listening to Jack Den uh, Denver uh, well, our master ceremonies and his alleged Canada Dry humor and telling you all about made order Canada Dry. We also have a product to sell. It's music. And may we show you now just how we make music. Listen, everyone, we're going to show you how we all make music. Now, first there's Wally. He sure plays some with two little sticks he beats on his drum. And that's how we make music. Now we have the boys with their violin. Their bows go back and forth when they begin. And the drums. Now the trumpets play loud and shrill, but when they get going, they'll give you a thrill. And the violin and the drums. The old trombone slides up and down. When he gets hot, he goes to town. And the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. When we want to shiver a quiver or a groan, we call upon the boys with the saxophone. And the trombone, and the trumpet, and the violin, and the drum. Please, please, now, when we want some rhythm, where do we go? Why, it's old Bob Rice with his old banjo. And the saxophone and the trombone, the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. Oh, the cow is now a little birdie. All right. Now, the next old fella can't be beat. You know him well. It's Piccolo Pete. And the banjo and the saxophone, the trombone, the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. Okay, Ben Bernie, if you like it. That's it. Now we have the piano for cadences and such. All he needs is a very light touch. And the piccolo, and the banjo, and the saxophone, and the trombone, and the trumpet, and the violin, and the drum. Thank you. 
And so are you, so are you. Now the old bass fiddle plays way down low. He has to get a Derek to move his bow. And the piano, and the piccolo, and the banjo, and the sanko, and the trombone, the trumpet, the violin, and the drum. Hey, please. Bass, piano, piccolo, banjo, saxophone, trombone, trumpet, violin. Now that's how we make music. That was cute, George. I mean, babies will like it anyway. <laughs> and, um, uh... That, ladies and gentlemen, is the way these boys make music. Now, if they could only play it. Uh, Mr. Olson will now play Come West, Little Girl, Come West. And I'm supposed to sing a chorus of this number. And do you know, folks, that six months ago, I couldn't sing a note. Really, I could not sing a note. But after taking three glasses every day of Canada Dry made-to-order ginger ale, I still am unable to sing and can't even sign a note. So the moral of this is drink that champagne of ginger ale, Canada Dry, and don't worry about signing notes. So for want of a better soloist, Miss Chute will sing, Come West, little girl, come west. I'm going east. I love to hear a cowboy sing like a cowboy sings when he's blue. Round the campfire on the range When his daily work is through If I could hear a certain love song What memories it would bring I can't forget that love song The cowboys used to sing The sun will set, the moon will rise But I want to look in my baby Come west, little girl, come west. The breeze will blow, the stars will be, but I'm too lonesome to go to sleep. Come west, little girl, come west. Oh, don't be pining away, way down east. Oh, my love here for you will increase. I love the west, it's full of charm, but I rest best in my baby down. Come west, little girl, come west. The sun will set, the moon will rise, but I'm gonna look in my baby's eyes. Come west, little girl. Everybody, this is Kate Smith or uh, Jack Benny talking. I mean, you see how nervous I am. I mean, not so much because I'm broadcasting, but I think all my relatives are listening in, and I don't want them to know that I'm working. Uh, although I have uh, I have an older brother that I'm quite fond of. I mean, we get along great. We sort of share everything together. I mean, what's mine is his, and what's his is his. You know, I, uh, although I, this has absolutely nothing to do with. Canada Dry made to order. I keep getting entirely off the subject. But don't forget, folks, that you can walk into your neighborhood drugstore or any drugstore. I mean, after all, I don't care what drugstore you walk into. I'm just the master of ceremonies here, that's all. I mean, if I'm going to have to worry about things like that, you know, I'll have my hands full. But go into any drugstore and order a glass, mind you. Not a bottle, but a glass of made to order Canada Dry ginger ale and stagger out. Isn't it funny the things you can buy today in a drugstore? I went in for an aspirin the other day and came out with a new hat. I, I, I imagine the next number will be by George Olson. 
He's about to make his first appearance on this program. In fact, I'm lucky to get in here at all. Uh, this is called Drums in My Heart. And boys, try and finish this all together if you can. Will you please? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, was the last number on our first program on the 2nd of May. Are you sleeping? Huh? I hope you'll be with us again Wednesday. In fact, I hope I'll be here Wednesday. George, so we all hope that we'll be here Wednesday. Well, good night then. All aboard, away we go. Get that little lady on the train, boy. All aboard. concluding the first program in a new series sponsored by Canada Dry. The ginger ale now available made to order at drug stores and soda fountains as well as in bottles. Canada Dry has presented Jack Benny, Ethel Coupe, and George Olson and his music. The same group of artists will be with you at this time Wednesday evening. Drums in My Heart from Through the Years was played tonight with the special permission of the copyright owner. This is the National Broadcasting Company. WJZ New York. Beady eyes flashing with hatred. Great teeth gnashing with rage. Powerful fingers flexing, flexing, eager to crush out life. The huge ape glared down at us from the great durian tree. How were we to dislodge him from his perch and bring him back alive? That is the story of Giant Jungle Man. From the tangled wilds of Borneo, from the mystic mountains of Tibet... From the fierce jungles of Malaya, bring them back alive. RKO Radio Pictures presents Bring Them Back Alive. Filmed in the depths of the Malayan jungle, 
The only wild animal picture which can never be duplicated, Frank Buck's original Bring Him Back Alive, is authentic, thrilling, packed with action and suspense. The dramatic story of the jungle, the land of the short shadows, where survival of the fittest is the law of life. See Frank Buck in Bring Him Back Alive. And now, for the first time on the air, RKO presents The Jungle Adventures of Frank Buck. The jungles of Sumatra, where I went on an expedition shortly after filming the motion picture Bring Him Back Alive, are as thick and dark and beautiful as any in the world. The trees are huge, giant durians towering a full 200 feet in the air. Matted with vines and creepers, make a complete roof over your head. And in places, blot out entirely the sun and the sky, the breeze, so that you struggle through a hot, dim, perpetual twilight. And you feel that the rest of the world does not exist, that there is only the jungle. And it was to Sumatra that I went, seeking to capture a giant orangutan. Majestic and savage, the orangutan is a member of the Anthropoid Ape family. He is built like a man except that he has shorter legs and longer arms, that he has man's dignity, and sometimes more than some men's sense. I compare him to man because that is how the Batiks, the natives, think of him. In their language, Urang means man, and Utan means jungle. So Urang Utan means man of the jungle. And sometimes they add the word bizarre, meaning huge, enormous. My jungle man was indeed bizarre. He was the largest orangutan ever captured alive. When I told Ali, my number one boy, why we were going to Sumatra, he was full of objections. Young orangutan, we catch plenty. Get plenty from Batik or Dayak. Big orang no can catch. Big orang kill man. Why not get young orang? Wait for him to grow big. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that wouldn't work, Ali. I need a full-grown orang for an exhibition next year. Orang live only in Sumatra or Borneo. Mm -hmm. White man law say no can take big orang away. Well, we'll go to Sumatra. I think I can make arrangements, sir. But when the necessary permission came through, we motored to the edge of the jungle, then followed jungle trails to a batik village where I had dealt with the Bangula, the headman, on other animal hunting expeditions. Ali held a palaver with the batik leader and returned to report... Tuan, Pangula hmm? say me as bizarre, big orang in this forest. He sure it's a big one? He say me as so big, three shakes when he climb. So big he darken sky when he swing through treetops. All right, tell the Pangula we'll make camp here. Tell him to get his scouts on the trail of this me as bizarre. And when they find him, I'll see what he looks like. Pangula say me as look like giant. Very fierce, very strong. Snap neck of men like bamboo. Break back like dry stick. Ah, uh, Pangula is just building up for a better payoff. Tell Pangula I pay his scouts the usual amount. Pangula say Orang very dangerous. Tell him I'll pay his men a bonus if the Orang is full grown. I tell. Good. But Pangula say must be careful. Already Orang killed two men. Pangula say hunting Orang like hunting death. Like hunting death. Yes, if a giant orangutan closes his huge fingers about a man, draws him close, sinks those sharp canine teeth, sharper and stronger than any tiger's teeth, it means death. Hunting an orangutan was hunting danger. But you don't have to hunt danger in the jungle. Danger hunts you. And while the Pangula dispatched his scouts in search of the orangutan, Ali and I set up our jungle camp. Next morning... To one. But Tick say have found big orang. So soon? Find him in jungle. How far away? Say Tiga Makinsari. Hmm? Three chews of beetle not away, huh? Three or four miles. Well, we better get going if you want to get there before dark. Yes, come quick. Now we catch giant jungle man. Vines tangled the jungle growth. Ali and the Batiks chopped our way with parangs, strong jungle knives. And the trees arched overhead, shutting off the sun. The air was heavy, humid. Myriad insects and flies swarmed about our faces. Leeches clung to the damp underbrush, attached themselves to our skin. Orchids bloomed and rotted in the tree forks. And all about us, the voices of the jungle chattered and hummed and cried. Silent only when death walked. Tuan, better we rest some, huh? 
Uh, how much farther, Ali? Not far, but Arang keep moving on. Batik trail him. We plugged on. Sweat beaded our faces. Drenched our clothes. We fought our way through slime and muck. While up ahead, our quarry swung along lightly in the cool treetops. At last, we heard the voices of the scouts, and finally we came out into a wooded area where the undergrowth was not so thick. The Batiks were surrounding a giant durian tree, and high in its branches, the orangutan perched, staring at the queer creatures on the ground as men stare at animals in a zoo. Eyes bright in a wide, flat face like black leather. Sandy reddish hair dripping from his long arms like Spanish moss from a southern oak. Nias Bizarre. Enormous jungle man. So big the trees shook when he moved. Big, you see, Tuan? Big like house. Yes, he's big, all right. It's a good thing we made that cage as big as we did. Cage big enough, but get around in cage. That's big job, too. Yeah, this is a good spot to try. The other trees around him are small. Look, tell Pangula to get his men to surround that tree. Keep the orang where he is. How keep him in tree when men on ground? Mias jump from tree to tree, make road in tree top. Well, we'll just remove that road, surround the tree, drive him up higher, then get axes and cut down the other trees. Clear a space around that durian so he'll have to come down if he tries to get away. Leave Mias in tree like men on desert island. Mm-hmm. Angula! Angula, keep Mias in tree! Get axes! We catch Mias Pizza! Two and all finished. Three all clear now. Good. Now get that net in place and give him my rifle. Rifle? Mm hmm. You shoot bigger angle? No, no. You remember the stunt I used with that leopard we caught last year? Yes, remember. Kuching in three. Yeah. We shot the limb out from under him and he fell in the net. You think can do the same with me, us? Well, we can try anyway. Concora! Come in with net! Get on the tree! The batiks on reluctant feet brought the heavy rope mesh net under the tree. High in the durian, the fierce eyes of the orangutan were calm and curious and a little contemptuous. But the eyes of the batiks were anything but calm. They showed white with fear as trembling hands supported the net. Ali handed me my right hand. Slim not too big. Not take too many shots. Uh, three or four should do it if I place them right. Good. Two on hit limb first time. Now one a little farther down. Hit again. Oh, me as not like. Move farther out on limb. So much the better. The farther out he gets, the sooner his weight will break the limb. Limb cracking. Limb falling. Oh, it's no good. Limb fall, but me has jumped, see? Me has jumped to another limb. Oh, it's no use to one. Not catch me as that way. No, Ollie. No, I guess all we can do is wait till he gets hungry and thirsty enough to come down. Not catch him in trap on ground. No. If he come down, he run for jungle. Well, we'll have the butt cheeks keep the net ready. When he comes down, they can throw it over him, tangle him in it, and shove him in the cage nut and all. Well, Batik not like tangle or hang. Batik afraid. Tell the Pungulu if they catch him in the net, I'll double the bonus. They can try. Orang maybe not like tangle net. Maybe Orang tangle us. Five days I spent in a jungle lean-to. Five days while the tropic sun drew clouds of steam from the damp earth in the clearing. Earth that had, until we cleared the trees, not felt the sun since the world was young. And five nights while the insects hummed and bit and drove sleep away. Leaves for a roof, earth for a bed, and the open jungle for walls. But we had food and water. And on his perch in the durian tree, the jungle man had neither. And as the time passed, the rage in his eyes was fire. Sooner or later, he'd have to come down. Then my boys would capture him in a net. Or so I thought. Tuan, Orang start down tree. Pangulu, get those boys up there with a the net. Now, if they can roll him in that net, we'll have him. Mia's almost to ground now. Come on, Ollie. Come on. There he come. Yeah. All right. Watch out for him. All right. Get the net over him, quick. Come on, get the net over him. He throw my teeth 20 feet. Yeah. Orang, go back up three. Tuan. Tuan, where are you? Help me out of this, Ali. That confounded ape wrapped me up in the net. High up in the durian tree, the jungle man leered down at us. At the edge of the clearing, the scared white eyeballs of the batik surveyed the scene. Since the orang had thrown one of them through the air, broken his neck, I'd never get the natives to try the net again. There was only one thing to do. Set the trap with its heavy log door in a crotch in the tree. 
So we attached ropes to the corners, threw them over limbs of the durian, and the natives hauled away. Ali climbed three, guide trap. I'll keep the orang covered with my rifle in case he starts for you, Ali. If Mia start for Ali, shoot for Mia, not for three limb. Ali not want to fly yet. All right, don't worry. You better get going. Angulo, easy now. Let Ali untangle that rope. Rope loose, pull again. Mia, stay off limb, throw at me. Stay where you are, Ali. I'll put a stop to that. All right, Ali. I fired close to him. He's going higher. Pull away on those ropes, Pangula. Come on, come huh? on. Here is good place to pass the trap. Hold it, Pangula. Watch me as he's coming down. All right, he's going back again, Ali. All right, trap fixed. Put nice piece on. Nice banana, lots of banana inside. It's all fixed. Ali, come down now. From his perch high above us, the giant jungle man peered down. His brow wrinkled like a pawnbroker calculating a sale. He was suspicious, but he was hungry, too. Angolo, get those men back out of the clearing. The natives drew back. I watched the giant orang. Ali crouched near me. Juan, look, he come. Slowly, slowly, the giant anthropoid eased down the tree. Nearer, nearer he approached the trap. One hand reached out. Touched the cage, drew back. Look, he tried to touch food. Yeah, you put it back where he can't reach it, didn't you? Ada, yes. We back, have to go in. Yeah. Oh, Mia's plenty gila, plenty mad. Look, look, he go in. See, door fell in place. We have catch jungle men. The giant orang struggled for several minutes. Then philosophy took over. After all, he was hungry. And there in the cage was food. He reached for the bananas and started eating. Months later at the exposition, my giant orangutan was on display. And a visitor asked, Mr. Buck, hmm? how did you catch this orangutan? Well, in Sumatra, orangutan means jungle man. Ask your wife, sir. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Killers of the jungle. A fight to the death with a crocodile. A mad elephant on a rampage. A battle royal between a 30-foot python and a tiger. See? Bang, I'm back alive. RKO Radio Pictures has presented a jungle adventure of Frank Buck. In this series of original radio dramas, all characters are impersonated. See and hear Frank Buck in person in his great wild animal picture, the original Bring Him Back Alive. Filmed in the depths of the Malayan jungle, the only wild animal picture which can never be duplicated, Bring Them Back Alive is authentic, thrilling, packed with action, danger, suspense. It's a picture for every member of the family, an exciting experience in motion picture entertainment. See the most ferocious jungle killers in their native haunts. See Bring Them Back Alive. It's another great RKO radio picture. Again, we bring you another chapter of Edgar Rice Burroughs' amazing history of Tarzan of the Apes. The astounding record of a superman who became the master of beasts and the mighty monarch of the African jungle. By the grace of a kindly god and the tender care of Kayla, at whose breast the little son of Lord and Lady Greystoke was nourished, Tarzan grew to young manhood. From his natural parents, he had inherited fineness and intelligence. And from his foster mother, Kayla, and the ape tribe, he had acquired tremendous strength, amazing agility, and animal cunning. And some 20 years since his abduction, we find Tarzan swinging through the jungles, a young man, splendid both in his youth and manhood. Carelessly, Tarzan's body swings from branch to branch. There's an easy grace about his perilous leaps and accurate catches as he progresses from limb to limb, which suggests both the assurance of the ape and the flowing rhythmic grace of a trained trapeze artist executing an often rehearsed feat of daring. Tarzan is off on a holiday. He's returning to the one place in the entire jungle that is his own, a place he had discovered long ago, a tiny hut on the shore of the great water. It has taken him many years to learn 
how to manipulate the odd mechanical thing which had swung open to him the door of that hut, which he would have been surprised to learn was the home of his mother and father and his birthplace. However, the door of that hut had opened to him more than the interior of the rude cabin which Lord Greystoke had built for his wife and son. It had taught him that he was an M-A-N, not an A-P-E. It had taught him to read and write after a fashion. For hour after hour, year after year, he had poured over the first primer which he found there. But perhaps more important to his physical being and survival, it had given him access to the hunting knife which hung at his side and the locket which dangled from his throat. Occasionally, Tarzan left the ape tribe and ventured to his hut near the seashore. And now he's making his way there. It's late afternoon. The sun of a dying day is filtering through the dank foliage of the trees to make an intricate pattern of onyx and gold on the spongy mold on the ground beneath. The jungle is reverberant with sound. The chatter of monkeys, the singing of birds, and the occasional growling and snarling of the larger animals as they make their imperial way to the water hole. Tarzan is happy. Happy as a schoolboy on a holiday. Swinging along his tireless, arboreal way, he inhales that dank, pungent smell of the jungle with boyish delight. And the grim grandeur, the poisonous beauty of the jungle fills his soul with a feeling for which the ape language has no name. Meanwhile, off the West African coast, a small tramp steamer is plying her way through a placid sea. In the tiny salon of the ship are four people. Professor Porter, an old savant who exists in the present but lives in the archaeological past, his daughter Jane, a beautiful girl, whose charm is not only that of beauty but of wholesome loveliness and intelligence. Of these charms, the young man of the group is fully aware. He is William Cecil Clayton, a young Englishman, typical of the blonde, blue-eyed Oxford gentleman and eldest son of Lord Greystoke. The other man in the salon is the captain of the ship. What are you reading, Father? Uh, 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 yes, of course, my dear, of course. Uh, <laughs> I asked you what you were reading. Oh, oh uh, sorry. Uh, a book, Jane. Uh, one of those dusty ones that you persist in believing gives me my hay fever. It's called Africa Cristana. Uh, Mochili wrote it in 1816. Only 1816? That's rather current fiction for you, isn't it? Uh, well, a man ought to keep up with modern literature, or, or he's liable to, to become an old foggy, a Clayton. <laughs> I suppose anything published after the flood would be considered rather modern by an archaeologist, wouldn't it, Professor Porter? Uh, oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on with your reading, Father. We won't disturb you any more. We're almost there, aren't we, Captain Tracy? Uh, I beg your pardon? Well, honestly, I don't know which is the worst, you or Father. It's enough to give a person an inferiority complex. I'm the only one aboard that seems to find me most fascinating. But you're forgetting me, aren't you? Well, one could never forget anyone so gallant. But really, Captain, a person would think that you were burdened down with all the worries of the world. Uh, not all of them, Miss Porter, but I'm afraid I have my share. Oh, really? Why? Mm, merely a matter of ship's discipline. Uh, nothing really important, I hope. Beg pardon, sir, but I'd like to see you, sir. Yeah, what kind of discipline is this, Newton? Coming in without knocking. Take off your cap. Yes, sir. Sorry, my lady. Well, well, what is it? What is it? I'm afraid, sir. It... Don't ever let them know I told you, sir. They'd skin me alive. That's what they do, sir. They'd skin me alive. A blight, sir. What are you talking about? Mutiny, sir. Down below deck, sir. Mm. They're all in the forecastle, sir. Uh, mutiny? Mutiny, isn't there some law about that? Mutiny, uh, I smelled it coming. That rotten crew we shipped at said. My compliments to Mr. Yant, Newton. And tell him to report to me at once, here. I'll batter those deck guys down in their hats and scuttle them like rats. Hey, pardon, sir, but it's the first mate you that's leading the mutiny, sir. He's down in the glory old talking to him now, sir. Oh, oh, he is, eh? Is there anything I can do, sir? Uh, don't worry, Clayton. I'll clean this affair up in a minute. You keep Miss Porter and the professor from being frightened. Well, I'm not at all frightened. Beg pardon, sir. I'd better get below before they miss hit me. They'd kill me if they knew I'd informed you, sir. All right, Newton. I'll remember this. Go below, then, and save your skin. Thank you, sir. Mr. Clayton, you'll find two automatics in the drawer of that desk. You'll take one and come with me? Certainly. Uh, what am I going to use? Oh! Good Lord, it's Newton. Come on, Clayton. Right on. 
So what's the matter? The door stuck? Stuck nothing. We're barred in. <laughs> While the voyagers from the world outside are at the mercy of a mutinous crew, miles away, Tarzan is hanging from a tree branch overlooking a clearing in the forest and sees the beginning of a jungle tragedy. Sabor the lioness is dozing, surrounded by her happy family. One of her cubs wanders beneath the tree that hides Hista, the snake, the silent, strangling horror of the jungle. Hista, hungry and alert, drops part of her great and snarling length down from the branch and circles the cub, draws it up into the tree to slowly force it down into a constricting being by the undulating, torturous contraction of those great ring muscles. Sabor the lioness awakes to the danger with a snarl of mingled rage and anguish, hurls herself with a terrific leap to rescue her cub. She misses. Again and again she leaps in a frantic effort to reach the snake. Her roar shreds the chaotic monotone of the jungle into tatters. Sabor's bestial anguish moves Tarzan to pity. He falls forward, giving himself a tremendous impetus with his legs and catapults himself through the air. It's a tremendous leap, superhuman. He's leaping for the end of Hister's tail. If he makes it... He may not be able to cling to that slimy, lashing length and will fall to the infuriated beast below. He won't make it. He won't. He does. He slips. He slips. He holds. His weight nearly jerks Hista loose from the branch. Like lightning, Hista contracts to lash him to the ground. But Tarzan lets go, drops to the branch beneath. Grasping it just in time, he falls past. He dangles for a brief moment, but just for a moment. A snarl warns him. He's hanging close enough to the ground to be in reach of Sabor's vicious leaps. He pulls himself up to the branch. The tip of one of Sabor's claws cuts a tiny gash in his heel. He stands on the branch, gathers himself for a leap. Oh! Hits the sinuous body, slaps the top around his waist, tightens, then slowly commences to draw him up to the branch above, where it shall hold him fast against the branch and exert a terrific pressure which will crush him. Tarzan struggles terrifically, but slowly, slowly feels himself being drawn. Tarzan's mind races. With a great effort, he unwinds the grass rope around his waist, snatches the long hunting knife from its sheath, and plunges it into the narrow part of the reptile's tail. The snake writhes, but doesn't lose its hold. Hastily, Tarzan works the blade through the resisting muscular strength until the handle protrudes at one end and the blade at the other. The serpent's agony has caused it to lose the distance it's gained in drawing Tarzan to the branch on which it lies. Tarzan is on the level with the branch from which he's drawn. Hurriedly, he ties the rope above the knife, letting it slide down the snake's body until the knife keeps it from slipping. Then, rushing like a madman, he snubs the rope around the branch. Hista strains. The branch creaks ominously, but doesn't break. The pain of pulling against the knife in his body makes Hista slowly release its hold on Tarzan. Unable to let go of the branch above and secure to the one below, the great serpent is all but powerless. Its body is stretched up almost straight. Its dreadful leverage is gone. Tarzan climbs up the trunk of the tree, gains the upper branch. The cub is still struggling feebly. Tarzan, still clinging to the tree, extends his legs out, locks them around the branch and hits his neck in what is known in wrestling as a scissors. He applies the pressure of those powerful legs. Harder, harder, harder. Pulling the lion cub from the mouth of the reptile with one free hand. Hister's great mouth opens wider and wider. No longer eager to keep up prey, only anxious to escape the pressure of those powerful legs. The cub is free. Tarzan swings down, drops the cub gently on the ground and up again on the branch before Sabor can furl herself upon him. Sabor, seeing her cub restored, pounces upon it, licking it, turning it over gently, worried. The cub recovers his breath and whimpers. Convinced that her offspring is safe, Sabor turns her attention to the thing up in the tree. Tarzan sits panting. Strange that after his good deed, Sabor should be anxious to factor into ribbons. Jungle gratitude. However, undismayed, Tarzan looks down into the baleful eyes and snarling face of Sabor. There's an ominous creak, a splintering. The limb under Tarzan is given way. He's falling, falling into the merciless fangs and terrible claws of Sabor. He grasps the small branch. It breaks. Tarzan plunges downward, downward, falling to the ground. He strikes the ground. On his head and shoulder, he lies still, unconscious. <laughs>
have a swell room now. Don't faint. Don't faint. <laughs> Listen, Eddie, never mind about that. We hear lots of music. But I'm what I'm interested in is Hollywood, you know? I can't hear enough about it. I guess everybody feels that way, too. Listen, tell us something of the intimate doings of the picture colony. You know, the things that are... Oh, nothing. you want dirt. Oh. <laughs> well, listen. Some of those people in Hollywood have places with eight rooms and 11 swimming pools. And do they throw parties? You know, at the end of each party, the furniture's swimming in a different pool. And are they wild? <laughs> Say, Eddie, I noticed those couple of blue marks there on the back of your neck. Did someone bite you? Well, not exactly, but I gave Claudette Colbert a bungalow, and those are the blueprints. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eddie, you know, I didn't know that you were carrying on that way. Quiet, quiet. Winchell might be listening. And get a load of this. You know, the first day I arrived in Hollywood, a certain foreign star, a blonde Venus with million-dollar legs, called me up and asked me to come over to her house. I ran quickly and told my boss, Samuel Goldwyn, and he called her on the phone and said, Listen here, I'm paying this guy Cantor $2,000 a day, and he's out here to make pictures. I can't have him running around nights so he can't work days. $2,000 is a lot of money. Please leave him alone. Well, did she? Well, Jimmy, the next day the Satan star sent my boss a letter saying, and close fine check for $14,000, send Eddie over for a week. (laughs) (laughs) Well, sir, when I got back... You know, Goldman wouldn't talk to me for a couple of days. Yeah, but you finished your picture, the kid from Spain, for him, didn't you? Oh, yes, yes, I did that. I did that, all right. You know, I understand there's a great bull fight in that picture, Eddie. Tell me, did you really go in and fight the bull, or did you have a double? Oh, Jimmy, the work was too dangerous for a double. Oh. Did you play the part of the Toreador, Eddie? Sh- shows you how much you know about bullfights. Jimmy, it takes five people to throw the bull. The Toreador, the Picador, and the Matador. That's only three. Who are the other two? Open the door and close the door. <laughs> Well, what else happened to you? Well, this is a funny experience. You know, I put my hand in the bull's mouth to see how many teeth he had, and the bull closed his mouth to see how many fingers I had. But kidding aside, Jimmy, you know, I actually went into the ring with an $8,000 bull. Yeah, some bull. Quiet, quiet. I'll get the laugh. And when you say that's my... You know, the second time I went in with this bull, I had an accident. Did he gore you? No, 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 he bit me. This is on the level. You know, when they get mad, they're like dogs, bulldogs, you know? I was rushed to the hospital. It looked pretty serious for a while... And I asked the doctor for a pencil and paper. The doctor said, don't worry, Mr. Cantor, it's not that bad. Even if you have hydrophobia, we'll cure you. You don't have to make out a will. I told him, I said, I don't want to make out a will. I want to make a list of the people I'd like to bite. (laughs) That's pretty good, Eddie. Yeah, (laughs) don't laugh. You were the second one on the list. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, who was the first? Rubenoff, the old potato. Say, listen, Eddie, from what I've been reading in the papers about the kids from Spain, it must be a great production. Great. Great. Jimmy, you don't know. It's colossal. It's stupendous. It's gigantic. Well, it's pretty good. I understand there are a lot of good songs in the picture, Eddie. Why don't you sing us the best one? Oh, no. Oh, no. I won't do that. But I'll sing you the worst one. Well, why not the best? Ah, for the best one, people should go and see the picture. Can't. There's no fool. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker for the sweetest gal in town. I'm all bound up with a brand new love affair. I can't tell which way I'm going, cause the world is upside down. I know that I'm gone. The panic is on. She has lips that taste like wine. I like hers. She likes mine. What a perfect combination. No wonder we're in love. When she sits upon my knee, I take this and so does she. What a perfect combination. No wonder we're in love. She taught me one thing. Love is only what you make it. And I know one thing. She can dish it out and I can take it. We both want a family. I want twins and so does she. What a perfect combination. No wonder we're in love. I like bread. She likes jam. I like eggs. She likes ham. What a perfect combination. No wonder we're in love. Can she cook? Can she sew? She can sew and sew and sew. What a perfect combination. No wonder we're in love. Once she liked crooning. Used to go for Rudy's Valley. We started spooning. 
Now her radio is in the alley, fragrant as a blushing rose. Wish I had Durant's nose. What a perfect combination. No wonder we're in love. Is coffee your weakness? Then science has wonderful news for you. If you're a normal, healthy adult, you don't have to say no thanks when you're offered a delicious second cup. But science says that coffee must be fresh. Coffee that is fresh is good for you. The rancid oils that develop in stale coffee often cause headaches, indigestion, and sleeplessness, while coffee that's fresh is healthfully stimulating to the digestion. So be sensible, you coffee lovers. Use Chase and Sanborn's dated coffee if you want to linger over that marvelous second cup. This coffee can't be stale because it's delivered fresh to your grocer, and he sells it fresh to you. Try a pound of Chase and Sanborn's dated coffee tomorrow. The date on every can is your protection. Rubinoff and his violin, his solo, some of these days. You know, Eddie, 
I've been thinking about all that scandal that you told about Hollywood. Were you telling me the truth? No, Jimmy. The truth is much worse. You know, next to the picture business, Hollywood's finest local output is scandal. A scandal out there is sacred. You know, I confided a secret to three people all told, and they all told. <laughs> here, here, here's how it spread. Tell me about it. I confided to my chauffeur that I saw Norma Shearer pay a visit to a rival studio at 5 o'clock. He told the garage man that a new star, Norman Scherer, was signed up by the Rivoli Studios for five years. The garage man told the barber that an enormous sheriff was over at the Rivoli Studios to collect five months' rent. The next day, the barber told me the story, illustrated with cuts. What did he say? He said, horses with sheriffs just cleaned the ravioli studios and found 500 chorus girls dressed without clothes, and that he knew it personally from Eddie Cantor who came to his house. How do you like that? <laughs> Boy, that's certainly twisting things around, Eddie. Ah, but Jimmy, you know, the people in Hollywood aren't really bad. They were all good once. They just like to play follow the leader. Only if the leader is going downhill, they're ahead of him. <clears throat> Fads in Hollywood are as catching as the measles. You know, if Barbara Stanwyck gets a new necklace from her husband, every star in Celluloid City gets a new necklace or a new husband. And, you know, and since B.B. Daniels had a baby, the stalk is on the verge of a nervous breakdown supplying Hollywood. <laughs> That's scandalous. In Hollywood, they read scandal into everything. If a lady star complains of chapped lips, they ask her who is the chap. And if a director is out shooting a picture and wants three more days of grace, they say he wants three more days of Greta. And the way they blacken a man's reputation... Jimmy, it's awful. You know they go around saying that Clark Gable is really a henpeck at home, that his wife beats him and makes him wash the dishes while she goes out to see his latest pictures? That's a lie. They've got him mixed up with me. <clears throat> Why, do you ever do housework, Eddie? Do I do housework? It's one of those Hollywood lies. Of course, I... Well, I mend stockings once in a while and make the beds and do a little dusting and buy groceries. But when my wife wants me to wear pink chemises with all kinds of colored ribbons in order to fool the baby at night, ah, uh -huh, that's too much. Uh -huh. Well, Eddie, all that reminds me. I almost forgot to ask you about your kids. How are those lovely girls? Uh, Jimmy, you've touched a soft spot in my heart. You know, they're swell. All but the little one. That's Janet, you know. She's five. Since we went to Hollywood, she's fresher than ever. <laughs> she must be pretty bad. Well... One day, about two weeks ago, she did something terribly naughty, which exasperated my wife. And you've never seen an exasperated cancer, have you? No, I never did. Well, what happened to little Janet? Well, my wife wanted to give her an old-fashioned spanking, but couldn't catch her. The child hid under the bed, and when I got home from the studio, Mrs. Cantor told me what happened and asked me to bring Janet out from underneath the bed. As I started to crawl under, what do you think Janet said? I don't know. Go on. Tell me. She said, hello, Pop. Is Mama after you, too? <laughs> Well, I'll bet Mrs. Cantor has a lot of trouble bringing up five girls just the same, Eddie. Oh, yes. My wife has a lot of trouble bringing up the kids, but she's done a swell job so far. You know, Jimmy, I, I've worked pretty hard in pictures and on the stage, but I, I share my applause with her when I get home. You have a regular 50-50 arrangement. Eh? Oh, more than that. You know, I'm not a sentimentalist, but she can have everything I've got, and it's been that way ever since I proposed to Ida. That reminds me again, Eddie. I'm anxious to know just how a comedian would propose. How well, do you do it? Well, I tell you, I, I said, I love you, Ida. I haven't got a cent. And she said, I love you too, Eddie. I haven't got a cent. Okay, I said, we'll start married life two cents short. Ida, I said, I'm not so much on education. I haven't read a lot of books. You know I have no reputation. And say, let's not talk about my looks. Without a single thing to give you, how can I show my love is real? Right now, there's no way I can prove it except to tell you how I feel. If I only had a five-cent piece, enough to buy a cup of coffee, I'd drink water instead and go begging for bread. And I'd give the nickel to you If I only had a three-cent stamp On the note that's going to Risco With a song and a smile I would tramp every mile And give those three pennies to you And when my ship comes in with its fortune Gold all over its deck. I start banking my fortune, but you will sign all the checks. If I only had 60 seconds to live, 
to fill this heart of mine with sunshine. I stay close to your side and be so satisfied to give my last minute to you. If I only had an overcoat and though the wintry winds were blowing, I would weather the storm so that you would keep warm. I'd give my one call to you. If I only had one pair of shoes, and you know I wear size 11, I would give you the pair, and we'd have leather to spare to cut out a pocketbook too. Give me a chance, and I'll gladly prove it. Ask for the sun from the sky. I'll fly up and remove it. And you know how I hate to fly. If I only had a five cent piece, enough to get a cup of coffee, I drink water instead and go begging for bread. But I give the nickel to you. You are listening to KFI Los Angeles. This is the Chase and Sanborn Coffee Hour, directed by Rubinoff and starring Eddie Cantor, who tonight returns for his winter series of broadcasts. In Eddie's honor, Rubinoff and his orchestra present a novelty written especially for this occasion by Ernie Watson, one of the members of the band. Welcome home, Eddie. bad, eh? We're not sore. Rubinoff and the rest of the band asked me to give them a welcoming hand, so Eddie, we offer you 50 hellos and a song of welcome. Ready? Here goes. <laughs> welcome, Eddie, from Rubinoff, and all the boys as well. Welcome, Eddie. Say, how's the coast? We hear your pictures swell. The air's been quiet since you went off. We missed that master touch. And all those cracks about Rubinoff. We didn't miss them, not much. Listen, Eddie, the boys themselves are going to wish you well. But they'll say it with music, see, in a section, should sound swell. That's the tune that'll play. Welcome, Eddie. Each says it a different way. The fiddles are first. Mmm, sweet and low. You'd think they were welcoming Greta Garbo. The woodwind. Clarinet, oboe, and flute. There, that takes in everyone. Just as we had planned. Unless you want to figure Ruben off. Hey, after all, it is his band. Well, Eddie, there's the musical phrases. There's only one guy more welcome. That's Ruben off. He pays us. <laughs> Why, hello, George. Why, hello, Jimmy. How have you been? I've been fine. Say, Eddie, I want you to know my good friend, George Hudson. Oh. I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Cantor. I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. You've been doing very well, haven't you? Oh, very well. How do you say very well? Last year, Goldwyn paid me a quarter of a million dollars for a picture, and I got $50,000 for my literary efforts and about $100,000 for vaudeville, and with my work on the year, very well. Say, I must have made a total of $750,000. Well, I'm glad to hear it. You know who I am? No. 
I'm the income tax collector for the theatrical district. Uh huh. You know who I am? I'm the biggest liar on the air. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Hudson. I'll sue you later. I'll sue you later. What kind of talk is that? <laughs> nice work. Fine friends you bring me, Jimmy. You know, if I had my way, I'd keep the tax and let the government keep the income. Do you know? Oh, the government, Eddie. I'd almost forgotten. You know, when you left, I thought that you would be nominated for president by either the Republicans or the Democrats. What happened? I'll tell you, Jimmy. I had my name in ready to be nominated by the Republicans, and they crossed it off. Then I had my name up ready to be nominated by the Democrats, and they crossed it off. You were crossed off twice. Yes, sir. Double crossed. Well, you know, maybe it's a good thing I'm not going to be president. You know, after all, you know, the president of today is just a two-cent stamp of tomorrow. (laughs) But listen, you know, I'd rather be right than president, and Hoover knows it. If you don't think so, listen to this letter I got from him a week ago. Look. Yeah? Read it to me. Dear Eddie, the Republican Party did not nominate the best man. I know how capable you are, and if I am re-elected, I will appoint you to a position second only to that of president. Maybe he means vice president. No, no, no. I talk too much for that. <laughs> but what if Roosevelt was elected? Ah, Hoover does know that I got a telegram from Roosevelt saying that if he gets into the White House, I'll be right beside him in the position that he's going to make for me. I wonder what job he has in mind, Eddie. Well, maybe by next week, Jimmy, I'll be able to tell you. And I know it'll be something good. It's got to be. Both Hoover and Roosevelt know that I understand children... And if you've got the children of this country, and you know I've got most of them right in my own family, <clears throat> you've got power. The first thing I'd advise the president when I get into my new position is to make a hit with the children by simplifying the spelling of the English language. That's one of the reasons why Teddy Roosevelt became so famous. Before Roosevelt, you know how they spelled potato? No, Eddie. How did they spell potato? Like this. P-O-E-T, poet, E-I-G-H-T-8, O-W-E-O, potato. But today, thanks to Teddy Roosevelt, you'd spell it... Well, just potato. Now take the word trousers. He simplified the spelling in a second. So how did he spell trousers? T-A-N-T-S. That helped the kiddies in school, you see. Well, let's tell me. How are you going to help the kiddies? I'm going to simplify grammar. For instance, what is the plural of ox? Oxen. That's right. Certainly. So I'll make the plural of box, boxen. Simple enough. Now, what's the plural of mouse? Mice. That's right. So the plural of house is height. And what is the plural of man? Man, of course. Right. Then the plural of fan is fan. You know the plural of foot? Well, according to you, it must be footin'. No, 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 no. It's footsies. <laughs> One feet is a foot, and two footsies is a feet. So if I speak of a foot, and you show me your feet, and I give you a boot, would a pair be called beef? If one is a tooth, and the whole set are teeth, then more than one telephone booth makes two beef. If the singular is this, and the plural is these, then the plural of kiss should always be keys. Then one may be that and three may be those, so hat in the plural must surely be hose. When a cat meets another cat, there are two codes. The masculine pronouns are he, his, and him. Imagine the feminine, she, shiz, and shim. <laughs> Listen, I go, I am going, you go, and he went. I row, I am rowing, you row, and he rent. We speak of a brother and also a brethren, so when you say mother, be sure to say metheren. Man's, woman's, and child's must follow these rulings invented by Cantor and taught in all schooling. And finally, the plural of goose must be geese, and the plural of duck must be... (laughs) Why should anybody hate to go to school? How can anybody stay away? There's a lot of things you can learn to do at school. If you felt like me, you'd be glad to say. I love to go to school because I love my teacher. I love my teacher. I do. There may be other schools, but there's no, no teacher like my sweet teacher. That's true. I'm jealous of a doctor who sees teacher every day. I'm going to bring her apples just to keep the doc away. I love to go to school because I love my teacher. You'd love my teacher if you knew teacher too. Oh, I love to go to school because I love my teacher. I love my teacher. I do. There may be other schools, but there's no, no teacher like my sweet teacher. That's true. 
I started in that public school when I was only ten. If it wasn't for the public, I'd go back to school again. I love to go to school, cause I love my teacher. You'd love my teacher if you knew teacher too. Oh, I love to go to school, cause I love my teacher. I love my teacher, I do. There may be other schools, but there's no, no teacher like my sweet teacher, that's true. She went on her vacation and the pupils yelled hooray. She missed my what, 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 and came running back next day. I love to go to school cause I love my teacher. You'd love my teacher if you knew teacher too. The man who has directed our scientific research work on coffee really needs no introduction. He has consented to give a series of one-minute talks in which he will give you, in plain language, the results of these investigations. I take pleasure in presenting Dr. R. E. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Wallington. In addition to our extensive research work on Fleischmann's yeast, we have for the past three years been supporting research work in several large university laboratories to determine the real facts about coffee. We've learned some very remarkable things about the value and importance of this delicious beverage. And in this series of one-minute talks, I have been asked to pass on to you some of the interesting scientific facts that have been found by our investigators. I want to tell you how fresh coffee increases your muscular and your mental efficiency, how it delays the onset of fatigue, and how it helps you get more enjoyment out of life, and particularly... I wish to explain the real importance of freshness in coffee and what happens when coffee becomes old and stale and why we were led to put the date on every pound of Chase and Sanborn dated coffee. The facts about coffee revealed by the magic hand of science are as fascinating as a mystery story. I hope you'll enjoy these talks, which tonight I have only been able to outline. Thank you. Have you got two cents? Jimmy. Can you imagine he disappeared? Boy, have you got change for $10? No, but if you hold my papers, I'll go and get it. Well, all right, if you'll trust me with the papers. Okay, I'll be right back. Why, aren't you Eddie Cantor, the famous comedian? I'm Eddie Cantor. Oh, and to think 
You're here selling papers. No, 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 no. I'm just holding them for a boy. Oh, you needn't apologize, Mr. Cantor. I know how times are. I'll buy a paper and you can keep the No, no. Change. Look, look, look. I tell you, I'm not selling papers. I sing songs. I blacken up. I sell coffee. I write articles. I make pictures. I play in border. I invest in real estate. I raise daughters. I run for president, but I don't sell papers. Not yet. There, there, there. That's all right, Mr. Cantor. I won't tell anybody I saw you selling papers. Look, and I'll prove to you that I'm not selling papers here. I'll throw them in the gutter. Here, here, here. Here, young fellow. I'll pick up them papers. You can't throw junk in the gutter. That's not junk, officer. That's the Morning Gazette. Look. Look, it mentions you in the paper. Oh, is that true? Where? Here, it says New York has 7,200,000 inhabitants. You're one of them. <laughs> go on, go on. That's not a good paper. It's not, eh? Say, listen. The Morning Gazette is first in everything. Look what it says. Yesterday, we were the first newspaper to publish the death of Jimmy Wallington. Today, we are the first newspaper to deny the report. The Morning Gazette is always in the lead. Uh, well, how is our country coming along? Is there any improvement? Well, there's an editorial here that says our country is going to the dogs. But it's not true. The dogs had a conference and they don't want us. <laughs> oh, say, there's a picture of a pretty woman on the witness stand. Uh, what is she doing there? Well, that's the woman that stabbed the husband in Brooklyn a couple of months ago, remember? Oh, is that oh, true? Oh, but she has a great defense. Uh, the judge asked her why she stabbed the husband... And she said, I heard the police coming and I had to hide the knife somewhere. <clears throat> well, uh, what's the latest in football? Oh, here, the sporting page. The Yale halfback is tackling the dean's daughter. She is the goal of his affections. He's been making steady gains towards her. Yesterday, he was near the 15-yard line and in the scrimmage, her father kicked him half back to the campus and he wants 10 yards for interference. <laughs> well, you, you've read me all the news. I don't have to buy the paper. And don't try to throw them away or I'll pull you in. Yeah. Well, Eddie, what are you doing with those papers? Oh, I'm holding them for a newsboy. He went away to change my $10 bill. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy, that's a good one. <laughs> he went away to change a $10 bill, eh? Why, he'll never come back. You Don't say to... that, Jimmy. No, these New York newsboys are as honest as the day is long. Yeah, but the days are getting shorter and shorter. Quiet, quiet. You're inferring that the kid won't come back? Don't fool yourself. Say, I trust any newsboy. Some of the biggest men in New York sold papers when they were kids. Well, that's right, Eddie. You're right. To tell you the truth, I sold papers myself when I was a boy. Yeah? Yes, sir. You know, I'm a self-made man. Yeah, you yeah. knocked off work too soon. <laughs> Here's a change, mister. Much obliged for home. Yeah, see, Jimmy, I told you to come back. And wait a minute. Here's 50 cents for you, my lad. Oh, gee, that's swell. Yeah, I should say it is swell. Say, Bud, do you know who this man is that just gave you the half dollar? Sure, everybody knows him. See? I see him in pictures. Huh. Gee, swell. Well, why don't you thank him, then? All right. Thank you very much, Buster Keaton. Give me back that half a dollar. You're... <laughs> don't hurt him. Give me... Rubinoff's violin solo. He plays the colorful composition Chanson Bohème.
Eddie, I want to say something. It's right from the heart. It's certainly good to have you back. You liven up the town, you know? Uh, seems to be enough life on Broadway, Jimmy. <laughs> Yes, you bet. They're all rushing to save a minute, you know. Yeah, and what are they going to do with it? You know, you know the fellow who proposed to a girl in the automobile and she accepted him in the hospital? The speedometer said 60 miles an hour. The motorcycle cop said it was 90. The pedestrian said it was a shame. He said it was the life. And his friend said it was flowers. Well, what is all the rush for anyway, Eddie? Uh, people fall all over each other trying to get money. Not that money is bad, Jimmy. You know, eye specialists say that green quiets the nerves, especially greenbacks. But the dollar can never fall as low as the means some people adopt to get it. Well, how can you avoid this mad hunt for money? Ah, uh, you must just avoid a colorless life. Keep in the pink of condition. Do things up brown. Treat people white. Be well read. Get out onto the green, under the blue, so things won't look so black. Know when to stop and when to go. Stop being afraid. Stop worrying. Stop hoarding. Stop whining. Stop grasping. Stop looking back. Stop looking down. Stop stopping and let's go. The green light is on. Attend to your business. Leave the other fellows alone. And more important, get a little fun out of life. Everybody likes to give good advice on how to live. They mean well, but they are often wrong. Live your life as you see fit. Give yourself the best of it. Here's the only way to get along. If you want loving, go out and make love. Get a little fun out of life. Do all the nice things that you're thinking of. Get a little fun out of life. What does it get you to struggle and play? What do you gain by the things that you say? What can you do with one foot in the grave? So get a little fun out of life. If you like coffee, drink all that you wish. Get a little fun out of life. If you like fishing, there's plenty of fish. Get a little fun out of life. I have an uncle who's one of those cranks. He kept his money in 12 different banks. They closed one morning without saying thanks. So get a little fun out of life. If you like singing, stand right up and sing. Get a little fun out of life. Don't go around with your face in a sling. Get a little fun out of life. Get all the joys that are coming to you. If you like children, and most people do. If you meet someone who likes children too, say, get a little fun out of life. Fresh coffee is good for you, science says. But what is fresh coffee? Well... Fresh coffee is coffee that hasn't had time to grow stale after it's roasted. That's why Chasen Sanborn's dated coffee is always fresh, because it's rushed to grocers all over the United States and Canada by the same marvelous fleet of service cars that deliver Fleischmann's fresh yeast. Other coffee producers have tried to keep freshness in their coffee by packing it in elaborate containers. But freshness is a matter of time, not of packing. And Chasen Sanborn's is still the only coffee delivered this way. Chasen Sanborn's dated coffee is delivered fresh to your grocer with the delivery date stamped on every can. And no can of it is allowed to remain on a grocer's shelf more than ten days. So if you want to drink good coffee, and if you're anxious to enjoy that extra cup, use Chasen Sanborn's dated coffee. The coffee that can't be stale. Coffee that's fresh is good for you. Try a pound of Chase and Sanborn's dated coffee tomorrow.
We've just got one more minute before the hour is up. Is there anything else you'd like to say to your listeners? Just this. I love to spend this hour with you. As friend to friend, I'm sorry it's true. I'm telling you just how I feel. I hope you feel that way too. Let's make a date. For next Sunday night, I'm here to stay. It will be my delight to bring again, sing again, the things you want me to. I love to spend this hour with you. Good night. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have another Chasen Sanborn Coffee Hour starring Eddie Cantor. The Chasen Sanborn Orchestra plays an overture of Italian airs, and Rubinoff will play as one of his violin solos, the immortal souvenir. Eddie Cantor will reveal a new position to which he will be appointed after election. James Wallington speaking. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. Mr. Brummel, sir. Oh, yes. But such weather has its compensations, Robinson. It's good to be home like this before my own comfortable fire. Yes, sir. You've had a busy time of it lately, sir. At the palace, the race is everywhere with the region. Yes, and it's wearing, Robinson. Wearing this constant rubbing elbows with the great and uh, keeping them in their places. Ah, yes, sir. But the dinner, sir. Was the lark's tongue pie quite satisfactory? Perfect. Robinson, I have the best cook in London. Oh, sir, I'll tell him. Poor Pierre, he's been a bit down in the mouth of late. Really? Uh, yes, sir. He said... Uh, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, sir. Oh, yes, go on. Uh, he says, sir, it's an honor to cook for the great Mr. Brummel. Uh, but, oh, if he'd only get himself a wife. 
A wife? Good heavens, why? He thinks, sir, you dine at home more and entertain more lavishly. That he'd become quite as famous in his way as you are in yours. Oh, well, my compliments to Pierre. But as for marrying, what's a man to do when the lady to whom he lifts his eyes is already wed? No, I'm sorry, but I fear this must remain a bachelor establishment. Deuce take it, who can that be? I, I'll see, sir. Oh, dear, I hope I'm not going to be disturbed on a nice like this. Oh. Mm, nice fire. Hey, oh. Mr. Rummel, uh, it's a female, sir. A young female. Well, Robinson, she arrives most apropos. Sir, is this a plot between you and Pierre to get me married? Oh, sir. Uh, but she's crying and carrying on something terrible. But why come to my house to do it? Uh, she's sister. She's from her Greece. The Duchess of York. The Duchess? Gad, man, have her in, have her in. Uh, but wait, take this dressing gown. Uh, yes. Hand me my suit coat. Quickly now, Robinson, yes. quickly. Yes. Hurry, just a moment. Now, there. Now. No. <laughs> the master will see you. You may go, Robinson. Very good. You're from the Duchess? Yes, sir. Is anything amiss with her grace? No, Mr. Brummel. That is, I don't know, sir. Then why those tears? Oh, sir, I'm the most miserable girl. Her grace gave me a letter for you. Most secret, sir. She said to defend it with my life, if need be. Gad, let me have it. That's the terrible part, sir. I took the next stage from Windsor to London. And when we drew near here, I filled in the bodies for my letter. It was gone. Gone? It's true. This is serious. Who shared the coach with you? No one. Uh, that is, there was a gentleman, but he left. And you'd no conversation with him? No, sir. We did have just a word or two. I see. Tell me exactly what happened. It seems, sir, he'd seen me come out of the castle gate. And, well, sir, he asked me several questions. And then he came over and sat beside me. And he kissed you. Oh, sir. How did you know? And with his arm about your waist, it was easy enough to slip the letter from your bodice. Oh, I'm a good girl. There's no doubt. <laughs> Tell me, what did he look like? Answer carefully. He had black, piercing eyes, sir. And he was sort of thin-like. His speech? He sounded like a foreigner, sir. Maybe an Italian. Hmm. How was he dressed? His neckcloth was white and starched like a proper gentleman, sir. I remember that because I thought at the time, how elegant, just like the... I mean, sir... Just like your own. An acquaintance, perhaps. Had he any unusual features? His walk, sir. He limped to bed. Gad. Could it be? Uh, but this message, do you know what was in it? Oh, no, sir. I worship her grace. I wouldn't violate her confidence, sir. Besides, there were six seals on the envelope. Oh, please, Mr. Brummel, don't tell her grace. Find it somehow without letting her know. Wait. Her grace will have to know. Oh, Mr. Brummel, sir. I must learn what that message was. She said it was important. I must see the Duchess at once. Oh, sir. Oh, I'll see that you don't suffer. Robinson, my carriage at once. Who knows? The peace of England may be at stake. You do not see that, understand? Ha. Always this business. Très mysterieux. Jean, he say you are spy for the region. Is that so? Ah, caution. I shut his mouth for him. Yours I shut too. I will have you depart. I tell the police you are not Madame Baldair. Now get out. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. Oh, mon Dieu. I am so miserable I could kill myself. I will do it for you if you do not keep your mouth shut. 
Dépêche-toi. Can I? Oh, mon Dieu. Oh, mon Dieu. <laughs> Now we shall see what is in the letter. Mm, sacre. Ah, this will ruin that Tom Brummel. Now I finish him with the regent. Ah, voila. You stay there until I need you. <laughs> ah, Mimi! Oui. Oh, what you do to your eyes? Ah, this thought, she blacken it. Where is that red ink? Here it is. What you do to your sleeve? <laughs> do I look like I have been in a fight? You look terrible. Bon. Alors, I go now. Uh, Mimi, I have something very important in this room. Remember, let no one in or I kill you. Comprenez? Oh, Mimi, I understand. Uh, remember. Damn you, Baldir. You son of a camel. You do not know I have watched you through the keyhole. <laughs> no. You do not know that John, he make for Mimi a key. To that secret panel. That letter is all the seal. Soon I see. Well, it is addressed to Brummel, the famous bull. He will give much money for this. He's rich. He's handsome. He's very gallant. Maybe. He might uh, love the little French girl. Wait here. Be ready to go any minute. I may be five minutes or five hours. Yes, sir. Who goes there? A friend of the Duchess. I must speak with her. Her grace has retired. She is not to be disturbed. But hang it, ma'am. This is important. I must see her. I can't let you pass, sir. It would cost me my coat. I tell you, ma'am, the situation is desperate. Her grace... It... It's true. I have it. Will you take a message to the Duchess maid of honor, the Lady Inez? Oh, sir, I could never permit. Here's ten guineas. Oh, well, if it concerns her grace, step in out of the rain, sir, under this torch, and write your note. Hmm. Why, sir, you're the bull. Shh. Here's another ten guineas to prove you're mistaken. Quite right. I was mistaken. Good. One moment. There. There. Here's the message for Lady Inez. Yes, yes, Alfred. Let's to the palace. We'll pick up our friend Brummel on the way and have some pharaoh. He can't. The regent himself. He's been visiting his brother, the duke. Cat, what a narrow escape. Yes, yes, yes. Brummel lost his lucky scamp, spent me for 3,000 guineas last night. I must have revenge. I'll show you that your prince is not only the first gentleman of Europe, but he's also first the pharaoh. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gad, that guard, why doesn't he hurry? Yes, the Lady Inez will see you, Mr. Brummel. Yes, sir, this way. I'm taking you in through a private entrance, direct to her ladyship's chambers. <laughs> Tis only a few gentlemen know it, sir. I see. We're here, sir. Thank you, madam. Dear Mr. Brummel, uh, I shan't need you anymore tonight, Morrison. Yes, dear lady. I... 
I kiss your ladyship's hand. Oh, Bruno. How did you know that I had a secret passion for you? What is every woman in England so mad about, too? Oh, that... your ladyship overwhelms me. I am overcome by her inference. But the Lady Inez must believe that, though I venture much to see her, I hold her in too much respect to hope that you she... You have did. kissed my hand. Have you ever heard that lips grow jealous? But... But I can scarce give up this lovely hand. Oh, I knew my feeling for you would someday bring you to me. In fact, I have a wager of a new fan with the other maids of honor that I would someday land you. And I need a new fan. Brummel's taste shall select a fan for your ladyship. You shall have it tomorrow. But I compromise you by staying so long in your apartment. I have paid my homage. Now I depart. Oh, so soon? No, you're squeamish. Ladyship, I have a serious mission in the palace. I bear an important message to Her Grace. Can you arrange an interview with her at once? Her Grace? Oh, I do not believe in your serious mission. You've come to play the gallant to Her Grace. And I thought I was the one. Oh, I protest. Well, let me tell you to save your ardor. Her Grace will send you about your business in no time. Dear lady, I swear on my life my mission has not to do with lovemaking... Please go to Her Grace and say I must see her. At this hour? Impossible. My lady, she will thank you for it. And you shall have my undying gratitude. And how will you express your gratitude? So, on the jealous lips. <sighs> now, hurry, please. Much hangs on haste. Wait here. shall I see you again? Dear lady, who can tell? Fate is often very unkind. I see. I was merely the means of your gaining audience with her grace. Deserve, lady. Damnation. Is that nice? Oh, well, I hold nothing against you. Deserving and kind. We've arrived at the Duchess' door. Good night. Good night. And yet not such a good night as I had hoped. The fan will arrive tomorrow, ladyship. Sure. <laughs> you may enter. It's a pleasure, my dear Donald. Oh, gracious you highness. You. Thank you for seeing me. You, you are very beautiful tonight. Sitting there in your silver gown. You, you nearly make me forget my mission. Brummel, my friend... I'm sure you've not braved such a night just to pay me pretty compliments. I know your mission is important, but it is late. Your presence here is dangerous to both of us. It's great. I know. I realize. In all the debauchery of the court, your highness' good name stands out as the sun against the night. I would not endanger it. But I've come about your letter to me. My letter? Yes. It is lost. Lost? Yes. Taken from your maid on the coach to London. Taken, perhaps now in, in the wrong hand. Oh, Brummel, I'm undone. I'm ruined. Oh, dear Highness, do not be so disturbed. Tell me what was in the letter. Something very dangerous. Something that might be used against me. If it ever fell into the hands of the regent or my husband, oh, I can't tell what might happen. Why did you write it? As a sacred duty, Brummel. You know I never meddle in politics, but the civil rights situation is desperate. The people have protested for years. And the regent has refused to listen? Yes. Parliament has twice passed the Equal Rights Bill, but the regent will not sign it. Mark my words, he'll have trouble on his hands someday. That day is here now. Only this morning, word came to me from Pitt himself that an army has been secretly recruited to attack the moment his refusal is known. And I know the regent means again to refuse. Brummel, it'll be civil war. Your Grace, 
My friend, your influence with the Regent is so great. Highness. It's true, all of us know it. You're closer to him than any of his ministers. Far closer than any of the royal family. Then your message was... A desperate appeal that you use that famous, that disarming tact of yours to save your country. Highness, all that I have a fortune or of wit, I dedicate to securing that letter and to winning over the regent. In return, I... I can offer you only my deathless friendship. It's yours, Brummel. Is it something you wish? I dare to wish something impossible. Tell me. But you were free and much humbler in rank. And I, I too wish that. But Brummel, we face the world as it is. And we respect our obligations. Your grace. But about the letter, Brummel, what shall we do? There's but one thing to do. Prevent it from falling into the regent's hands. But how will you do this? Attach myself to him on some pretext. For days, if need be. Stay near him day and night until I recover that letter. Splendid. And now, dear friend, you must go quickly. One thing more. Why would it be so unfortunate if the letter fell into the hands of the Duke, your husband? One line of it is rather personal. It might be misconstrued. Your grace. I shall die rather than... His grace. Odd, wife. Still up. My brother. What the devil does this mean? We are plotting, sir. <laughs> Against you. I could almost believe it. But come, Brummel. No silly excuses. This is serious. <laughs> but Brummel is right, my dear. Have you forgotten? Forgotten? What? That tomorrow is your birthday? Why, so it is, so it is. Oh, Brummel, you old fox. What did it be this time? <laughs> that, sir, is part of the surprise. Well, mark you, not too dandyish. <laughs> not too dandyish. your estates, and, and, and all your women. <laughs> <laughs> a toast to his royal highness, the first gentleman of Europe, and a devil of a good loser. <laughs> to the prince, our future king. Yeah. Ah, thank you. But that Brummel, tell me, Chumley, where do you think he is, and what mischief is he up to? I've no idea. Our bow's only vice seems to be gaming. Of course, it might be romance. Oh, oh. Egad, I'd like to know some scandal of the bow. If, if anyone knew, it would be your royal highness. For next to his own conscience, you know him best. Odd's oh. body, Albanley. A well-cut neckcloth means more to the bow than Venus herself. Ah, Brummel's an odd duck. He's strangely uh, a chivalrous at times. Yes, uh, it was that affair of the foreigner, hey. Baldair. And the nursemaid. <laughs> it has wit, tell it. It, it seems Bulbear was amusing himself at the wench's expense as she wheeled her charge on the edge of the round pond. The girl's protests only added to the Frenchman's amusement. <laughs> <laughs> then the bow chanced along, and with one blow sent Bulbear spinning into the pond. <laughs> And the bow said, adjusting his cuffs, the fellow needed a bath anyway. <laughs> Struth, I'd like to have seen it. <laughs> the Frenchman in the goose pond. <laughs> uh, now I understand his hatred for the bow. Yeah, but the bow, quite undismayed, continues to write sonnets through the curve of a lady's lips. Though God knows if he ever tastes them. <laughs> Struth, it's a point in the lad's favor. 
One should have one friend with whom his mistress is safe. <laughs> <laughs> George Brian Brummel, Esquire. Huh? Your Royal Highness. Mm. Uh, Gentlemen, uh, my regrets. Ye gods, a bow with a rumpled neckcloth. A oh. bow with his hair awry. Brummel, you sly dog. Why so distray? Have you been on a tender mission? Or were you with the opposition plotting against your prince? <laughs> You'd be utterly astounded if you knew. Yes, I dare say. Oh, Brummel, you're deep. But truth, we've discovered you. Admit it, man. You've been with a lovely creature. Indeed, a very lovely creature. Again, <laughs> <laughs> I ache to describe it. I do better than your highness. Our Brummel with a beautiful creature, languishing with love for him. The moment opportune. And then most malapropos, the husband bursts in. Oh. <laughs> right, my lad? Right? Royalty is always right. <laughs> Shouts the injured husband. Villain, my wife's boudoir. At this hour, explain yourself. Uh, and our bull quite coolly replies, Good sir, I was but teaching thy wife a new way of tying thy cravat. <laughs> <laughs> my compliments, Highness. You read my innermost mind. <laughs> Good lad, your Highness. <laughs> but in truth, I had a sorry time of it. And I have yet to prove myself an honest man. Oh, 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 impossible. The bow could prove that black was white. No, I fear the whole thing was a myth. Egad, I believe the bow was sitting at home like a spinster, devising what to make us wear next. <laughs> you are positively omniscient tonight, Your Highness. There was the matter of a waistcoat. Abel? Something new? As new as the night. Uh, gentlemen, good night. Your prince is uh, occupied. Important matters and all that. Highness, I take my leave. Good night. I knew we had a problem. Now, now to business, brother. This waistcoat, would it become me? Better than anyone else in Europe. <sighs> I have a fine figure, haven't I? Not stout. You couldn't call me stout. Just uh, regal. Ah. Regal is the word. Yes. Pardon, Highness. Well, out with it. Word from uh, Mrs. Fitzherbert. To remind your Highness. Uh... Oh, yes. Uh, Brummel, I had uh, arranged uh, uh, tomorrow. I'll hear about your waistcoat tomorrow. Highness, I'm devastated. But dash it, man, I Oh, uh... well, the waistcoat was half promised to another anyway. Oh. Oh, well... Tell Mrs. Fitzherbert I am unavoidably detained. State business. National emergency. In short, a waistcoat. Ah. Now, Brummel, let's drink to the waistcoat. And to Brummel, my one good friend. <laughs> Pardon your lines. Play, take these interruptions. But one of the... Uh... Persons, your Royal Highness always admits us here. Who? Old oh dear, your Highness. Old oh dear? I'll see him. Your friend, Brummel. The fellow who had the bath. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? I? Nothing, your Highness. Well, I'll tell you. Wait there behind that screen. You know all our family scandal, anyhow. Monsieur Baudet. Your Highness. Oh, dear. What's the matter? Black eye, bloody sleeve. Oh, Highness, no, de Dieu. Such mere fortune. You know, I spy on Pete, leader of the opposition. Uh, today I follow him to Oatlan. For a long time he is closet with your sister in law, hmm? you duchess. Bad man, my sister in law against me, too? Go on. I, I keep close watch, and soon I secure a prize. A letter in the handwriting of the Duchess. Hmm? Oh, diable, as I hurry you to serve my prince, I am beaten and sacre norm, I am robbed of everything. But man, the letter, not the letter. Highness, I fight with my life, I fight for the letter. I threaten, I beg. Get up, dog. Had you read the letter? Highness, no. To whom was it addressed? Ah, a grand surprise. The letter was addressed to the boat, George Brian Brummel. Brummel? 
Impossible. All my life, I swear it, Highness. Did you call me Highness? Sacriste. Oh, Baudet. <laughs> Have you been romancing in the park again? Hold <laughs> your profanity. You rang, Highness? I did. Monsieur Baudet will wait outside for further questioning. And now, Brummel, what was in that letter? Well, it seems that the bow is to have full need tonight for that famous, that disarming tact of his. Will it serve to extricate him from this difficulty which threatens not alone the bow's neck, but the good name of a beautiful and gallant lady? For well, next week's chapter will tell the tale... And we need fear no lack of excitement, of thrills, and suspense. Listen at 8.30 next Thursday evening for the sequel to tonight's episode. Meanwhile, give thought to the power that lies today, quite as much as a century ago, in the subtle art of good grooming. And good grooming is not so much a question of what you expend on your wardrobe, as of the wisdom with which your apparel appropriation is invested. For almost a half century, the great house of blank and blank has held the proud position of America's foremost tailors to men. It was first among the great custom tailoring institutions of this country to make it possible for men everywhere to dress smartly and well, without extravagance. This year, more than ever, the exquisitely cut, superbly tailored garments of blank and blank are the mark of a gentleman, a passport to those all-important circles where good breeding and good grooming are esteemed. Blank in blank in all their history have never produced garments comparable with those which it offers you today. See these garments at the establishment of your local sponsor. Next week, we foregather again with the beau and his interesting friends. Until then, good night. Everybody, here we are, all ready to take you down to Pine Ridge for the Friday Night Sociable, conducted by Lum and Abner, whose everyday experiences are sent for you each evening, except Saturday and Sunday, by your own local Ford dealer. In my opinion, the new Ford V8 is the most economical car on the market, says Rankin Singley, grocer of Mangum, Oklahoma. We've been telling you what we believe about the new Ford V8. Now let us select this letter from the thousands received and tell you what this owner says. Mr. Singley writes, I own a Ford V8, and in my opinion, it is the most economical car on the market. On one trip, I drove 640 miles in 12 hours and 25 minutes. This included four stops and speed up to 87 miles an hour. And without apparently using any oil at all, the car averaged 21 miles per gallon of gasoline. Robert Abner would be glad to have your opinion of the new Ford V8. As we look in on Pine Ridge tonight, we find the schoolhouse completely filled and the neighbors still coming for the big sociable. The ice cream served last Friday probably accounts for the unusually large attendance tonight. Lum is in charge of the entertainment as usual and is ringing the telephone so the three listeners out on the party line hook up may be sure of hearing the festivities. Take down your receiver and listen. out on the party line. Mighty proud you're listening in. Wish you could be down here at the schoolhouse with us. We're having a big time, big crowd here. Recollect, me and Abner's are putting on these little get-ups every Friday night to sort of advertise our Ford business. All we ask is that you drive the new Ford V8 before you buy. 
Want to thank you all for the nice letters you've been sending in. Appreciate that. Now we get along with the coach bull. That's the Pine Ridge String Band over there playing. And, uh, all right, Cap, turn the boys loose. Let them go. <laughs>
days when California history was in the making, Don Hancock, the Robin Hood of this period, struggled bitterly against the Mexican governor, Manuel Michel Torrena. The governor planned the arrest of Don Hancock for releasing a number of Americans from jail, and also ordered the arrest of Don Cipriano Cabrillo and his daughter, Antonia Baker, for sheltering Don Hancock. We open this chapter at the Rancho Francisco Lopez, where Don Hancock arranged to meet Don Donaldo an emissary from Santa Ana, the president of Mexico. Ah, Don Hancock, how good it is to see you again, and the good Jose. It is a long time since I have been honored by a visit. Perhaps to you, Francisco, who have nothing to do from morning till night. But for me, time flies. Aye, no doubt, senor. And you fly with it, eh? (laughs) (laughs) See, Francisco. I wish to use your casa for a conference. My humble casa is yours, Don Hancock. And may I inquire, is it about the governor this talk? Yes, it is Michel Torrena again. He and that jackal of his, Garcia. An everlasting curse be on their names. They have been annoying you again, senor? Is that it? Mm, but not me alone, Francisco. It is everyone. The peons, the caballeros, and now the americanos. Can that be possible? See. Si. However, I think I now have Garcia and the governor where I want them. Aye. Don Hancock may always be trusted. Madre de Dios, who can that be? Probably Don Donaldo. Open the door, Jose. Aye, Don Donaldo. You have come sooner than I expected. I did not even hear you approach. Hola, Don Hancock. See, that horse of mine travels lightly. In truth, he must. Oh, but allow me. Don Donaldo, our host, Francisco Lopez. And Jose, you have met. I am deeply honored, senor. And will you not accept my humble casa as your own? With pleasure, senor Lopez. My business with Don Hancock is most important, and we have sought your casa for privacy. See, si. it is even more important than you think. How is that, senor? Just this. Since I agreed to meet you here, I have had another skirmish with Michel Torrena and Garcia. Explain yourself, Don Hancock. I'm keenly interested. I know that. I have definite evidence here with me. Jose, have you the bag? Right here, master, at my feet. I would not let it out of my sight. Bueno. Then open it and allow Don Donaldo to see for himself the fruits of my visit of last night. Oh, Dios. That money, where did you get it? From the governor, who in turn, with the very good aid of Garcia, took it from the trusting Americanos. Took it? You mean stole it? See, he might as well have. What you see here is payment for passports, for unjust taxes, land grants, And for what else, I do not know. But uh, how did you manage to know of this? Easily, senor. I managed to pay the governor a little visit and was fortunate enough to arrive at the very moment the spoils were being divided. Aye, but perhaps that was more unfortunate than otherwise. In what manner? Just this. 
You have, as you know, of course, already been accused of the Americanos' release from jail. Well, I know that, but what well, have you Well, this do... last action, to have taken from Mitchell Terena the money and notes he got from the Americanos will not be... But I intend returning them to the original owners. For you did not think, senor, that I meant keeping them myself. Of course not, Don Hancock. What I'm trying to say is that you have but further incriminated yourself in the eyes of the people if Mitchell Terena makes this public. Diablo, how can that be? This is stolen property. I am but doing the right thing. Surely, give... senor, I know that. And perhaps a few others. But the people, they do not like the Americanos, and what will they think? If you will pardon me, Don Hancock, I think the senor is right. Hmm. Mm, perhaps so. Nevertheless, I intend returning all of this, everything you see here, as soon as possible. I feel that I am doing the right thing. As you wish. But uh, in just what manner are you to distribute this back to the Americanos? Through Jose and a few of my men. I shall be glad to start, Master, the moment you give me the word. Bueno, I give you that word now. Here, take this bag. Guard it well. Find a few of our men at Los Angeles and see that the money is returned. See, si, Master. But how am I to know who these men are and what is owing them? Mm, I have provided for that. Here is a copy of the book of receipts. Everything is listed here in very good order. How convenient, senor. And how considerate of his excellency. See, si. And now, Jose, be off. Make all the speed you can. Vaya con Dios. Your word is my command, master. Adios. Adios, Don Donaldo. And my good old. You are indeed fortunate, senor, to possess such a loyal servant. But I still believe this is an unwise move. Unwise or not, it is done. Nor do I regret it. This original book of receipts, Don Donaldo, would interest Santa Ana, no? See, si. It represents documentary evidence of Mitchell Terena's acts of treason. Bueno, then it is yours. Take it to Santa Ana when you return to Mexico. It is enough evidence to throw Mitchell Terena out of the Californias. I shall take it, senor, gladly. It will give me enough proof to have him removed. True. But before the lazy wheels of justice move... The governor will have completed his ruin of California. Therefore, we need action. And from what I understand, you are planning that very thing, no? See, si. General Alvarado and I are even now formulating our plans. Don Donaldo, why do you not aid us? I should indeed like to, but I cannot. My position with Santa Ana prohibits my active participation in such warfare. Mm, that is true. I understand. But this business you came here to see me about, this personal matter, just what was it? I was just about to mention that. Uh, may we... Well, I'm sorry to say it, but may we trust our host implicitly? You may. I know him for a most honest man. Thank you, senor. But if you wish me to leave, I shall... It will not be necessary, now that I have been assured. First of all, Don Hancock, this mysterious seal on your dagger. I'm most curious about it. It is my symbol for the justice that I attempt to uphold. In truth, that you have upheld, Don Hancock... As I well know. I have tried to do my best, Francisco. Now, uh, what is it you wish to know about this dagger? A great deal. Its significance, its origin, and its relation to your general activity. Uh, that cannot be answered in a few words. But as to its origin, it was given me by my father at the moment of his death. At that time, I swore vengeance upon the persecutors of the Californias. Madre de Dios, I trust this is not the soldier. Do not be alarmed, Francisco. Open the door. Por Dios, Eduardo, you, you here? See, si, Don Hancock, Eduardo Flores, the traitor. Let me in. I am, I am wounded, badly wounded. Diablo, so you are. Francisco, give me that glass of vino. Here, here, drink this, Eduardo. It will revive you. Ah, gracias, senor. You were always so, so kind. And I... I repaid your kindness with... with treachery. Never mind that now, Eduardo. I know that you were forced to do what you did. It is forgiven and forgotten. How... how generous you are, Don Hancock. But I... I bring you news. Important news. That may atone Do for... not speak of atonement and the news can wait. I am concerned with you. This wound, it is a frightful one. It must be at least... Do not... do not worry about me, senor. But listen to what I have to say. Last night, by chance, I happened to be outside the governor's casa. Last night? And... Why, that was the very night I was there. See, I know. I saw you. And when I saw you pursued, I knew that... that something was greatly wrong. And so... so I sneaked to the window. And I overheard... I overheard... I... Santa Maria, I... you are in no condition to talk, Eduardo. 
Rest first and then talk. See, si, senor. Do as he says. It'll be best. No. No. I am... I am all right. It was just that running away from the casa. One of those... Those fool guards fired at me. Here is some water, don't Hancock. And a cloth. I, I thought that... Mm, bueno. Now, Eduardo, please allow me Later, to... Don Hancock. Later. Listen. I overheard the governor plotting to arrest you. Swearing out a warrant for... For treason. Because of... Because of those Americanos. Caramba. What do I care? I am not afraid of his stupid warrant. See, I... I know that. But Don Cipriano and his daughter, Antonia, they are also to be... to be arrested. But how can he do that? They have done nothing. They have protected you. Furnished you with... with shelter. He learned that from... from a spy. By the saints! I will not allow this. How dare he arrest those people? He would dare... dare anything. And I heard... I heard more. It is planned to... planned to... To Dios, I cannot, I, I cannot breathe. I am, I am. Here, there, rest quiet, my Eduardo. Do not speak. Drink. Here, the water will soothe you. Don Hancock, Don Hancock, come close to me. I am here, Eduardo. Bueno, listen. Listen, Don Hancock. Do you... Forgive me. But of course, Eduardo. Of course I forgive you. Gracias, senor. You are so... so good. Always so... so good. Dios de mi alma. He is dead. I... he is dead. Eduardo Flores... Your death will not go unavenged, nor will the arrest of those innocent people you died to save. I leave at once for the rancho of Don Cipriano. Featuring Al Goodman's orchestra, the Revelers, and Will Rogers. Good evening, everybody. The makers of that good Gulf gasoline and motor oils have appointed me toastmaster of this regular Sunday evening get-together. In their behalf, I'd like to invite you all to a new kind of banquet. A banquet given for countless thousands of motorists in every part of the country. Every Sunday night at this time, please consider yourselves the guests of the 40,000 Gulf dealers. They welcome you to an unusual and satisfying feast. Not of food, which you can get at any banquet, but of the music of Al Goodman's orchestra, the singing of the revelers, and a few words from Will Rogers. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, I guess our next bit of entertainment needs no introduction from me. You all know the revelers, and in honor of Will Rogers, America's favorite cowboy, they're going to sing an old cowboy number, the old Chisholm Trail. All right. Come along, boys, and listen to my tale. I'll tell you all my troubles on the old Chisholm Trail. Come on, on a ten dollar horse and a forty dollar saddle, I'm grown up on ten Texas cattle. Come a tie, you be, 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 Looking like rain, and the darn old flickers in the wagon again. Come a tie, yuppie, yuppie, yay, yuppie, yay. Come a tie, yuppie, yuppie, yay. If bacon and beans most every day, I'd as soon be eating prairie hay. Come a tie, yuppie, yuppie, yay, yuppie, yay. Come a tie, yuppie, yuppie, yay. Welcome to the feature of our Sunday night good Joe Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Will Rogers. <laughs> we, uh, we got quite a bunch of notables in here tonight on account of it being free. One, that's one thing depression has done. It's made all free entertainment popular. Uh, say this, this, this bird, uh, Roosevelt, he's working all the time and thinking about everything here. Here we got to, uh, he found that these New Yorkers here have been hoarding some daylight, and he held them up and took an hour away from them today. That's all switched around here now. Got quite a few. I'm glad the show's master didn't introduce me as a humorist. There's sometimes <laughs> one of them has some humor, and he calls me humorist. Because sitting right down here in front of me was one of the biggest rosebuds on his lapel. It says Irvin Carr. Irvin, uh, uh, it, it is your trouble, really. He introduced me as the humorist of poor Irvin. Because Mr. Irvin Cobb, I consider our greatest humorist. And when they remove the man, well, at some future time, our historian from Mr. Mark Twain, they won't have to take it very far. Just from the Mississippi River right over to Paducah on the Ohio. That's all. Right over there. And uh, I'm sure that Twain would not be jealous of the mantle, but he would have dispatched and this rosebud which he has on him. I have Mr. Eamon Carter of Fort... I don't know how a lot of these guys got in here. Lee Alwell and Eamon Carter. Got Mr. Walter Winchell here, who I understand uh, is responsible for really this President's Day, which I'm going to talk on if I ever get to it here. Uh, President's Day, well, well, they say Walter originated the idea, and I want to thank him for it. It's a very lovely idea. Mr. Walter Winchell, as you all know, is the maternity prophet of New York. And, uh, sure, I, uh, I, 
Mrs. Rogers is back here with me, and I hope he predicts nothing in our, along our line, because his predictions come true. Young married people often go to him to ask him if there's uh, any blessed event in the horizon. Now, uh, I, boys, you heard that fine band. Wasn't that a lovely band? And I noticed them. That's the only radio band I ever saw that played from music. They had notes. You know, and could play from the notes. Most of them just hear something and then remember it as good as they can. <laughs> the revelers, I want to pay my compliments to. I haven't seen them since they're way down on the tour in the South. They spent three weeks down there one time. They gave their services and done some splendid work. That's the greatest quartet in the world, is the revelers. They're not only a quartet, but it's four to sing. <laughs> I can sing. Now, now uh, this is President's Day. Uh, pre we, we generally recognize anything by a week. We have them by a week. We have apple a week and potato week and don't murder your wife week and smile week with everybody going around grinning like a possum and uh, for no reason at all. We have uh, don't get hurt by an automobile week. So somebody hit the bright idea, and they said, Winchell says, well, here, if prunes are worth a week, the president ought to be worth something anyhow. Huh? And uh, so they figured out they couldn't give him a week, but they could, uh, they compromised on a day. Uh, they, uh, well, the reason we give him a day was he cut down on everybody. And they says, well, he's been cutting down, so we'll just give him a day instead of a week. So that's how we, we're very generous that way. We're wonderful with our presence. When the sun is shining, we cheer them and uh, let it start raining. And if they don't furnish them, us, uh, you know, some umbrella and some goulashes, it's furnished by the government. Well, boy, we give them the boots right then. <laughs> the man we're, well, I'm going to try to pay a little respect here tonight, too, on account of being President's Day. We have no precedent in the accomplishments which this man has performed in the last... Uh, well, seven weeks has always been in there. That bird has done more for us in seven weeks than we've done for ourselves in seven years. <laughs> we elected him because he was a Democrat. And now we honor him because he's a magician. <laughs> he's a Houdini of Hyde Park. <laughs> and then maybe this Houdini of Hyde Park can't do everything. He may not get our hands out of all the handcuffs which we have foolishly stuck our mitts out and got them in through ourselves, but even if he can just get one hand loose, you know what I mean, and leave the handcuff hanging on the other, he will have accomplished uh, a great deal. He's a fast worker. He was nominated, uh, I mean, uh, no, uh, well, he was, no, uh, I was there when he was nominated, I don't know about that, but he was uh, inaugurated at noon in Washington, and it started the inaugural parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, and before it got halfway down there, he closed every bank in the United States. <laughs> and, and, now, now, a Republican would have never thought of a thing like that. No, no, he'd have, he'd have let the depositors close it. And, and mind you, mind you, Mr. Roosevelt was just two days ahead of the spouses himself. Uh, he was there, but that shows you how fast he worked. You know what? He's ahead of you all the time that way. And, and he went, marched on down and drove on down to the White House, and then he says, I believe I'll call up the boys. So he called up McDonald and this fellow that come from France, because we can't pronounce his name. He says, come on over here. I want to talk it over with you birds. And uh, so they've been over here. Uh, they went back smiling, but they had nothing signed. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, anyhow, then he took, the, he took the Democrats out of the unemployment uh, ranks, and uh, he's made postmasters out of all of them. And he's made Christians out of the Republicans. And all but, all but Ogden Mills, my friend Ogden Mills, who made an awfully good speech last night at the Gridiron Den in Washington. Ogden is still, he's, he's running around, kind of yapping around, but he's really subsidized by the Democratic Party to kind of put up the appearance of a uh, organized uh, minority. That's what... Uh, 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 we have... You'd, you'd be surprised at the, at the hordes of Republicans who are crawling up to this shrine in Washington to pay their respects to this 
modern messiah. This uh, maverick of the dis uh, that once disgraced the Roosevelt clan, you know, by uh, doing like Gandhi of Europe and uh, and uh, joining the untouchables, the Democrats. You know, only only Gandhi was better off because Gandhi was fairly well robed, but when. Roosevelt went into the Democratic Party. It didn't even have a loin cloth at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> now, uh, when, it, when he first went in there, it looked like he, he wasn't going to draw any dividends. Did you notice the first part of Roosevelt's career up to a late year was spent in doing nothing but nominating Al Smith for president? He'd always nominate uh, Al. You, you, uh, it, it, be it a breakfast or a lunch or a clam bake or a horse race or even a Democratic Party where Roosevelt would nominate Al. You could wake him up in the middle of the night, I'll bet, and say, hey, wake up, and then right away, before you'd ask what you wanted, he'd nominate Al, you know? And he made some fine speeches nominating Al because he was nominating a very fine man. And But, of course, the country wasn't ready for democracy because it wasn't broke yet. But the minute the country went broke, they put out a yell, a siren call for the old horse, you know, the old fire horse and wagon, and out it come, but not without a and the man, our hero himself, was sitting on the seat. He said to Al, says, Al, come on, give me a break this time. Let me have a crack at him. And, uh, boy, he took a crack at him. You talk about sweeping the country. Uh, Roosevelt swept the country like a new toothpaste. He went around, well, say they rushed up and voted for him just like buying tickets to some new Hollywood sex drama, you know? Oh, he was the one right over. And even the Roosevelt family, who up to then had only been eight cousins, looked up an old register and found where there was a long lost brother. They, well, sir, and he, he does everything. He does everything very quick, different from that. Look at the Wickersham. Wickersham worked two years and spent $2 million. And what did he do with his report? Turned in a report and says, now, I won't be sure. I can't get the absolute proof, but I think there's a little drinking going on around the country. And uh, Rose, Roosevelt says, I'll do, uh, I'll do all that in just three words. Just give me three words. Says, let them drink. That's all. See? <laughs> he says, let them drink. And he collected $10 million in revenue in the first two weeks. And if he'd had good beer, he'd have paid the national debt by now. <laughs> now, yes, sir, Wickersham, Wickersham turned in all a lot of a lot of figures and a lot of statistics and things. And Al said, no, just give me two figures. That's all I want, and I'll show you some results. Just give me three and two. Just three and two percent, that's all. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, commissions, commissions are fine, but uh, they turn in uh, always a lot of data about something that uh, that ain't so good. You know what I mean? I mean, it's bad data. They're all in, the, you know, always investigating things that are bad, and the data is bad. Well, what's the use of having a lot of statistics and data on something that you can't do? Well, it's kind of like garbage. What's the use of collecting it if you ain't got nowhere to put it? I mean, uh, you know what to do with it. Well, that's the way with commissions. Now, Mr. Hoover, the most conscientious fine, hard-working man I expect we've ever had in the presidency. And appointing a commission is not a, any crime. It's, been, it's been considered a very fine way of handling anything. But it just seems like a presidential commission don't get nothing done, you know. They don't really earn the breakfast that they give them at the White House the day they appoint them. That's what they don't do, you know. And uh, now... Speaking of, of Mr. Hoover, I've got something I think would be of, uh, of, of interest to you. I know it certainly was to me. The night before I left, flew back here from Los Angeles, I was talking to Mr. Harry Chandler of the Los Angeles Times. And he has, is a great friend of Mr. Hoover's. Mr. Hoover had visited him at his ranch. And uh, I, I was very anxious to know the feelings of Mr. Hoover at this time. All of us are. You know, here's this man come in here and created this sensation, which was never... And you often wonder, well, now, I wonder how Mr. Hoover feels uh, uh, going out and this man coming in and doing all this. Is he kind of uh, sitting up there at Palo Alto and eating his heart out and uh, kind of figuring, well, I got a bad break, uh, to this thing... And that and so everybody. And I asked Mr. Chandler, I said, Mr. Chandler, that's the way I feel. Now, well, how is it? And he was, 
said, as long as he told me, he says, Will, you'd be surprised. He says, a man is absolutely cheerful and feeling fine, and he's in accord with a great many of the things that Mr. Roosevelt is doing. And he says, he's just tickled to death that the country is, uh, looks like there is a pick up around, and uh, he, he's pleased to death. And I knew, I know I was tickled when I heard that, and I just thought maybe you all would be too, because Mr. Chandler didn't tell it to me for any think I was going to go blathering it around, but I, it, was, it was interesting to me to know, because, and we all are, because we know he, he did work hard for us, and did, and, uh, and we're tickled to death that he's, that he's feeling good about it. You know, those men go about things different way. Now, Mr. Mr. Hoover didn't get results because he asked Congress to do something. That's why he made a mistake. He ought to say, this, this fellow, Mr. Roosevelt, he just sends a, a thing up there every morning and says, here, here's your menu, you guys. Sign it, you know what I mean, right here, you know. Right here it is. What are you going to order? You know, and he tells them just what they're going to have. That's what he does, you know. Every morning he does that. All of them work different. They know how to work Congress. Now, Mr. Roosevelt, he never, you know, he never scolds them. You know, he kids them. That's what he does. He never scolds them. You know, Congress is really just children that's never grown up. That's all they are. And uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, I'm looking at watch here. I've got to see what, how much time. Whoa, here. Uh, <laughs> Well, there you are. Now, Mr. Coolidge handled the thing all together different. Now, there's a man that he, he handled Congress. He didn't pay no attention to him at all. He wouldn't mess with him. He, 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 Congress at all. He never messed with commissions either. If the fish wasn't biting in the Columbia River and the Abyssinians wasn't practicing birth control, who were never, I mean, Mr. Coolidge, he never messed with him at all. He just let it go along, you know. He never cared. He knew how to handle the whole thing. Seems funny me up here telling all this bureaucratic thing, you know, any big company is owned by Republicans, so Democrats ain't got nothing, you know. <laughs> and so I asked these people, I said, how about it here? I'm going to get up and naturally say something complimentary about the Democrats. So they tell, they tell us, as well, it's all right, Will. We'd rather have been saved by a Republican, but if it, we will take a Democrat anyhow. <laughs> That's the way it is. Says we'll be saved. We'll be saved by, we'll be saved by anybody. You know. I mean, that's one good thing about a Republican. He'll just, he just, don't, you know, he wants to get his six and eight percent. He don't care whether it was got through, uh, through Mussolini or Hitler or Hitler or Sister Amy or uh, even the, even even the King Fish Huey Long, the old. Louisiana porcupine, he, they'll, they'll be saved by him if necessary, you know. Now, I understand Mr. Roosevelt, somebody told me, was listening in. Now, Mr. Roosevelt, we've turned everything over to you. Uh, we've given you more power than we ever give any man, uh, any man was ever given in the history of the world. We don't know what it's all about. We tried to run the country individually and collectively and along a democratic line, but boy, we, we gummed it up so, so you take it and run it if you want to, you know, and deflate or inflate or complicate or, <laughs> or you know, or, or insulate, and do anything just so you get us a dollar or two every now and again, you know? And uh, so we, you're our lawyer, and we're going to turn the whole thing over. To, things are moving so fast in this country now that we don't know what we're all, it's all about. The whole country is cockeyed anyhow, and we're disappointing you, and you take it. You don't know what it's all about, but God bless you. Whenever we go out together, feel my heart. You'll 
thanks a lovely bride. But she's my little one, my little one. I'll always call her little one. Although they say there's nothing in her name, it seems to fit her just the same. Oh, she's really quite sweet and very, very sweet. She's got me off my feet. I mean, she's hard to be. I'm just a trifle taller, but even so I call her my little one, my little one. Oh, how I love my little one. How tall she's really five foot three. I know one, I know one, I know one. I know that she has no fault as far as I can see. She's all and then some more to me. Days like by my side, whenever I'm with her, I'm just as happy as can be. Oh, she's really quite sweet and very, very sweet. I love to call her little one. Although they say there's nothing in her name, it seems to fit her just the same. One little little one, you never know how I adore my little one. My little one, oh how I love my little little one. She's as cute as she can be. How tall? She only five foot three. My little one, my little one, how I adore that little little one. Let's see as far as I. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's a young fellow here I want you to meet. He's a good Gulf service man from the state of Virginia. And let me tell you that if you haven't seen the state of Virginia, you haven't seen anything. But I guess I better let the Gulf man here tell you about it. Good evening, friends. I really can't say much, but uh, I hope that you'll drive down to Virginia sometime. Say, there, there ain't a prettier place anywhere than the Shenandoah Valley, Blue Ridge Mountains, and, well, it's all nice down our way. Anywhere, there's, uh, there's one thing I want to say. In Virginia or anywhere else, that good Gulf gasoline is the best there is. Just one thing I'd like to add to that. I want to remind all of you that you don't have to go away from home to get that good Gulf gasoline and motor oil. Just drive up to the orange pump anywhere. While you're there, the Gulf man wipes your windshield, fills your radiator, checks your tires and oil. No tips either. It's all part of Gulf service. In addition, you can have free for the asking a copy of Gulf's new comic weekly, a regular four-page, full-color funny paper. Don't miss it.